We'd just like to extend a welcome to you all. Um, just a couple of house cleaning items. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Dave Roper, uh, here asked to uh, be the uh, facilitator of our symposium. Uh, we'd like to just first recognize uh, a lot of effort that's gone into uh, helping us with the symposium. First, uh, we'd like to recognize Walla Walla Community College and thank them for being able to host us. Also, I'd like to recognize, I think they're outside, you've met uh, both uh, uh, Marvin Duggar, our president, and uh, Darla Grimm. Would you stand, Darla? Darla's really been the anchor to, to bring this together, so I just want to recognize those folks uh, for helping us with that. We're going to move through this as close as we can to the scheduled agenda, and uh, if there are and, and I'd also point out for those not familiar with the facility, the facilities are just outside to the left. Uh, we're going to be here most of the day. We've got some wonderful things to talk about. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to make the introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, sportsmen, fishermen, and fellow enthusiasts of steelhead and salmon, it is with great pleasure that we gather here today for the landmark event that marks the convergence of science, passion, and stewardship. Welcome to the Citizens for the Preservation of Fish and Dams Pacific Northwest Fish Symposium. As we embark on this exciting journey together, we are brought together by a common purpose, the conservation, management, and preservation of our beloved fish species in the Pacific Northwest. In this hall, we're privileged to be surrounded by a cohort of dedicated professionals and experts who have studied the intricacies of fish behavior, survival strategies, passage, and the delicate balance that sustains these fragile habitats. Their unwavering commitment has paved the way for innovative methodologies, sustainable practices, and novel solutions that ensure the well-being of our steelhead and salmon. Over the course of this symposium, we'll be treated to an array of presentations that delve into the heart of fish management, survival, transportation, and preservation. These captive reports will shed light on the breakthrough discoveries, effective conservation techniques, and cutting, ed and cutting edge in advancements in technology that enable us to safeguard the biodiversity that flourishes within our waters. As we come together to listen, learn, and exchange ideas, let us remember that our actions today shape the legacy that we have for generations to come. Through collaboration, innovation, and a shared commitment to responsible stewardship, we can steer the course towards a future where our fish populations thrive, ecosystems flourish, we see the full utilization of the river system, including agriculture, power generation, river transportation, and the resources of the Pacific Northwest remains intact. So without further ado, let us watch and listen to the wealth of knowledge that awaits us. Let us honor the dedication of our presenters by engaging in thoughtful discussion and fostering connections and being inspired to take action. Together we have the power to make a difference, not just for the fish, but for the very essence of the Pacific Northwest's natural beauty. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey. Here's to a symposium filled with enlightening conversations, unforgettable insights, and a renewed commitment to the preservation of our steelhead and salmon. Our first presenter is Mr. John L. McKern. He is our keynote speaker. His first presentation is about the history of the decline of the Columbia River salmon. John McKern is a retired Corps of Engineer fish and wildlife biologist. He came to the Walla Walla District of the Corps in 1971 after attaining a BS degree in wildlife sciences and an MS degree in fishery science. His graduate work was on life history biometrics of steelhead trout. His work with the Corps originally concentrated on fish passage at the dams, but grew into fish and wildlife measures to mitigate the effects of dams and reservoirs. He administered many research contracts for fishery studies related to the effects of dams, and a pioneering study assessing the wildlife and habitat from the mouth of the Columbia to the Canadian border and the Snake River to Weezer, Idaho. 
As a consultant since 2000, he provided expertise to the Idaho Power Planning Council representatives, to Coville Tribe on Chief Joseph Hatchery, and to the Yakima Irrigators on the Fish Passage at Klee Elam, and other Bureau of Reclamation Yakima District Dams. Please welcome John McKern. Thank you. Um, many of you have probably heard that if they breach the four lower Snake River dams, it'll save Idaho's salmon. Many of you probably heard Paul Harvey when he told the rest of the story. So I'm going to tell the rest of the story. Clicker. I'm going to try to tell the rest of the story. We got a technical already. Do I have, where do you have the pointer? Ah, point it down there. Point it that way, he said. That's what he said. Okay. Can't hear you, John. Okay, so we're going to start at what I think probably was the beginning of the Columbia River salmon because of the cataclysmic floods that occurred between 15,000 and 12,000 BC. There were 50 to 100 of these mon monstrous uh, floods that came from, oops, technology, okay, that came from Glacial Lake Missoula here and flooded down through the Columbia system, one ice dam by another. And the biggest one probably was here at Walula Gap, which flooded this area where we're sitting at least 200 feet deep. And you can imagine what it was like to see a wall of water coming at you several hundred feet high at 50 miles per hour and how you would have run like the mastodons did. Yeah, now we got it. Okay, Marm's Rock Shelter was one of the earliest Indian dwellings uh, in the area, and it was flooded out by Lower Monumental Dam. The artifacts go back 10,000 years, and the artifacts in the, in the uh, rock shelter indicated that about 5,000 years ago, the Indians went from hunter-gatherers to uh, depending heavily on fish populations. That was true around the Pacific Rim. And here we have the six different Pacific salmon, uh, including the Japanese cherry salmon, Oncorhynchus masau. This shows in white, which doesn't show up too well. Uh, some of the tribes, some of the native peoples who were dependent on the salmon. The key on the Columbia River, of course, was Salilo Falls. This was before it was inundated by the Dalles Dam uh, in 1958. The numbers of Chinook, or the numbers of salmon that have been said to coming back to the Columbia have been as high as 16 million, and the tribes may have taken two to four million before the coming of the non-native people. Their numbers were decimated by diseases before the non-native people got here and so the numbers that they were harvesting obviously went down. When the non-natives got here they saw the runs of the Columbia as a resource to be uh, ex exploited and so in the 1860s with the advent of canneries it became possible to harvest this prodigious runs of salmon, can them, and send them to markets all around the world, uh, the East Coast, Europe, Asia. And these are different methods that were used. The gill netters, the beach seines, the fish wheels, and the traps. The gill netters basically worked the lower river. Uh, there were fish wheels all the way up to the Dalles. Saners worked down in the lower estuary and the traps mainly were down in uh, the Baker Bay area. 
The river commercial fishery, as I said, really started to take off in 1866 with the advent of canneries on the Columbia. Starting with one in 1866, by the early 1900s, there were 53 canneries that were exploiting the runs of salmon that were coming back. Not only that, but historically, the Columbia River salmon were much larger than they are now. And this is a picture taken in 1910. This is a 116 pound Chinook. This is a 121 pound Chinook. The biggest caught Chinook that I have seen, I think it is the world record is 127 pounds. Although something I just read indicated they may have gotten as large as 145 pounds. And one of the things that really changed that from large fish to small fish was the way that the commercial fisheries were regulated by net size, stretch size of the mesh. So they harvested the biggest fish to can and smaller fish kept going up the river to spawn and it eventually probably affected the genetics. This is a fall Chinook at Lower Granite Dam. Now, the fall Chinook have been uh, pretty much uh, in, increased in numbers due to uh, increased spawning in the lower Clearwater and Hell's Canyon, and they're, and also, uh, well, and, and they're now the largest Chinook that are coming up the uh, Snake River. The biggest impact to the the salmon fisheries are the ocean fisheries. Trollers, of course, are trolling lures to catch fish, oftentimes catch smaller fish, which they call shakers, and flick of the wrist, they're off, oftentimes damaged to the point where they won't survive. Saners, they will catch other types of fish or fish that can't be kept. What's thrown back is called bycatch. Gill netters, gill net the fish, and again, it's stretch size on the mesh that governs what size fish they're catching, and a certain number of fish fall out, are never harvested. Bottom trawlers. Bottom trawlers are after things like hake, and oftentimes Chinook will be down deep and be caught in bottom trawls. Right now, the Kenai River in Alaska is closed to Chinook fishing because they say bottom trawlers are catching too many in the bycatch and not enough are being allowed to come in to spawn. Another major impact that started with the arrival of the non-natives was logging. Started on the lower river, started on the Walla Walla River by uh, Whitman. And one of the big impacts there is that logs are often, were oftentimes dragged down the bottoms of streams. And then in the bigger ones, they would build a splash dam, not passable to adult fish going upstream, store the logs, blow out or remove the splash dam and let them go down the river. And this is the last log drive on the Clearwater River. I think it was in 1970. Logging also has impacts, railroad and road construction methods have been devastating to a lot of streams. Here we have a road construction. Here we have three men standing up there looking at the scene. Railroad construction, a real mess. And oftentimes they use culverts to uh, cross smaller streams, spawning streams, and uh, those culverts were poorly installed and wound up to be uh, too high above the stream bed and fish couldn't get in. And in Alaska, I've seen a stream this small with a hundred Chinook in it, or a hundred coho in it. So it was devastating to a lot of different kinds of salmon. Forest fires, the big burn in 1910, burned three million acres from Eastern Washington to Montana. And if you read the, the book, The Big Burn, you would find in there that a lot of Small fish were being boiled in the streams and the ash going into the streams made the, the streams uninhabitable. So that was another major impact. 
Another major impact happened in the 1860s when gold was discovered on the Weai Prairie, northeast of Lewiston, and it started a gold rush, there's a nice nugget, started a gold rush that was uh, rival the one in California. You can imagine what it was like when all of the little streams and smaller rivers were being torn up by uh, gold rush, uh, I'm trying to think of it, anyway, by the people who were seeking the gold. And as things became more mechanized, they, they found a way to mine the valley floors. This is at Sumter, Oregon. It's the old gold dredge that has since then been uh, uh, spruced up and become a, a park. This is the Powder River Valley where the whole valley was turned over, turned upside down. This is what's left of the Powder River flowing by here. And you can imagine what it was like when you took a river valley and tore it up, turned it upside down. And this dredge, not this dredge, or at least some dredge, went way up almost to the top of the ridge. I was amazed at how far upstream it went. We've heard also that the Idaho streams are pristine streams. This is a dredge that operated on the Yankee Fork of the Salmon River. And this is wording here from the Northwest, Northwest Power and Conservation Council's Fish and Wildlife Program. And they say that the hab habitat was severely altered by dredge mining. And so the Northwest Power Planning Council uh, has funded uh, mitigative measures for that. Another effect of mining in a lot of different areas was hard rock mining and the Mining tails leached chemicals into the streams. This is Bucktail Creek. It came from Blackbird Mine. Bucktail's a tributary of Panther Creek, which is a tributary of the Salmon River. By the early 1960s, contaminated water resulted in the Snake River Spring and Summer Chinook salmon being eliminated from Panther Creek. 19, this is a picture in 1974. This is in 1992. And this is in 2012. This stream was remediated by the BPA Fish and Wildlife Program to the tune of $50 million. Okay, I want to change gears now and talk about garbage. This is a what they call like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the Pacific Ocean. These are not showing up very well, but there are different garbage patches in oceans around the world. This garbage patch here is more than twice the size of Texas. Remember that. Here are some of the impacts of garbage. This is a blue whale. You can imagine a blue whale thinking he was coming up under krill and coming up under a garbage patch and getting a huge mouthful and choking on it. This is a sperm whale. Sperm whale typically feed on squid, giant squid. Black plastic bags floating in the water might imitate giant squid. In this one, which they autopsied, they found 100 plastic bags. The, better, the Build Back Better Act has 200 million in it for no cleanup of the oceans. You may wonder what that has to do with the salmon. Well, even the orca, which we all know, the southern resident killer whale population is in jeopardy and some people believe that breaching the lower Snake River dams will resolve their problem. So now they're looking at garbage cleanup and NOAA Fisheries, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NOAA and the Navy are spending, seems like a small amount, one and a half million dollars to try to clear, clean up the problem. But where that comes in, as far as the salmon are concerned, they are, when the juveniles reach the ocean, uh, northern strains of copepods dominate 
the uh, invertebrate population when the, when the ocean is cool, but as it warms up, southern strains come f further north. The northern ones are larger and ha are richer in fat, and the southern ones have less fat and are smaller. So when you have no northern copepods abundant, survival of salmon and steelhead goes up. When southern copepods are abundant, survival goes down. They're the, the basis of the ocean fish, or the o ocean food web, and the copepods also are ingesting microplastic. This is a fingertip with micro and nanoplastic chips on it. And so when they're ingesting those things, those things are now going up the food chain into the animals that eat the copepods, the smaller fish, bigger fish, and so on. Here's the food web in the ocean. Here we've got uh, where the plastics are coming in, working its way up. Chinook here, killer, killer whales here. Another aspect of it is the pollution in the environment. And as an apex predator, pollution in the environment is concentrated up through to the uh, killer whales. Some of the ones that are concentrated are listed here. Some of them you're probably familiar with. Dichloro, diphenol, trichloroethane, or DDT. Uh, polychlorinated biphenols, or PCBs. PFAS, or per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. And it's been found that they call infectious hemopoietic necrosis in fish. I don't know if you remember, but in the 1990s, the production at Dorshack Hatchery was almost wiped out by a IHN, the steelhead production. Fortunately, they had a couple million extra smolts up at uh, Kuski Hatchery that they brought back and pretty closely met their mitigation requirement. Oh, I forgot to mention that one, didn't I? The bottom one here is six PPD quinone. University of Washington's been looking for what was called killing the coho salmon coming into uh, Lake Washington for a number of years. And finally, they narrowed it down to 6-PPD quinone. It is, it is deadly to coho salmon. Oops. So where does... 6-PPD PPD quinone come from? It's in tires to increase their wearability. A group is suing Oregon California transportation agencies at this time because of the fatal impacts to salmon from 6-PPD quinones. The Center for Biological Diversity has filed uh, a lawsuit. Think about where tires may wear and the runoff may get into your salmon streams. It's fatal to coho, it's harmful to Chinook and sockeye. I, I have mentioned before there's a wall, a border wall between the United States and Canada. Science can work its way across that border wall sometimes, but usually doesn't. So the Canadians are ahead of the U.S., and they're already trying to find ways to battle 6-PPD quinone with uh, gardens where the effluent goes through the garden and the quinone is taken out. I wanted to talk just a little bit about irrigation. It's said that, that reaching the four snake river dams wouldn't have much effect on irrigation. There are, is no substantial irrigation taken out of Lower Granite, Little Goose, or Lower Monumental Reservoir. There's about 100,000 acres irrigated out of Ice Harbor Reservoir. And Ice Harbor Dam, one of the authorized purposes is to provide this irrigation. In the red circles here, these are two areas that are irrigated for uh, wildlife mitigation for the projects. Uh, there's something similar to that down by Chief Timothy Park you're probably all familiar with. Whoops. Ah. Okay. 
Now let's talk about worldwide ocean temperatures. This is a, an animation from Central Washington University that shows pretty much the normal distribution of hot water in the oceans. It also shows substantial ice cap up there. And this is the Columbia River mouth. This is what happens in the ocean. You have uh, the coastal temperatures are affected by atmospheric conditions and that's indexed by the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and you have a couple of events called El Nino and La Nina. I wanted to point out with this slide that from 1977 until after 1996 the flows or the temperatures in the pardon me the flows in the Snake River Basin were below normal. This is what it looked like in the ocean in 2015. This is what NOAA Fisheries was referring to as the blob. And again, here we have the mouth of the Columbia River. So we can see it went all the way up to the Gulf of Alaska. What's the effect? Well, the effect is that warm ocean temperatures bring predators and other fish further north. Here we have Pacific Jack mackerel, which aren't a very large fish, but they compete with the salmon and steelhead for food. Albacore tuna, typically found 40 or 50 miles offshore, are in close to shore now. And the wahoo, the king mackerel, which can grow up to be about five, six feet long, uh, was found off the Skeena River in British Columbia. The Skeena runs in near Prince Rupert. That's how far north the warm water and that was this year, by the way. Okay, now I wanna talk about the historic range of the salmon. And you've all seen uh, pictures like this. The yellow areas were not available because of natural barriers. The brown areas are ones that were blocked by dams. The green areas are the ones still available to the uh, Columbia River salmon. And so, of course, we have this area in here that's still available to the Snake River salmon. Shoshone Falls, probably many of you have seen that. It's not hard to see why that's the upstream barrier to salmon, or it was historically. A number of dams have been built below Shoshone Falls. And if you look at these, starting back 1901, 1910, 50s, 59, 37, 67, 61, 67, all built, well, up to this point, all built before Ice Harbor Dam was put in. Then you have Ice Harbor 62, Lower Monumental, Little Goose, and Lower Granite. Hell's Canyon Dam came in later, later, but thousands of Chinook and Steelhead were blocked from spawning grounds in the up in the middle. Snake River Basin by Brown Lee Dam when it closed and when Oxbow Dam closed two years later. These, the reason why there were two major blockages is because the first one happened, the other fish were still out in the ocean growing and then they came in. And all in all, those two dam, or those three dams blocked access to two thirds of the spawning habitat for Chinook, spring, summer Chinook, and steelhead, and 85% of the spawning habitat for fall Chinook. Fall Chinook spawned in the main river all the way up to Shoshone Falls. Now let's talk about tributary dams. Again, it's the same sort of thing. The ones in red had no fish passage. Sunbeam Dam. Here, and it's highlighted because I'm going to talk more about it. From 1909 to 1934, blocked access for all salmon. Well, <coughs> from 1909 until the 1920s, blocked access for all salmon to the Stanley Basin. And in 1920, they built some makeshift fish passage. But by that time, of course, all of those salmon runs from the Stanley Basin were extinct. Oregon Fish Commission Dam, that's an interesting story. The Indians sued because they wanted fish restored to the Wallowa Lake. And the manager of the 
irrigation district went back in the newspapers and found that in 1998, 1898, the Oregon Fish Commission took place the dam on the Wallow River, took all of the salmon, all kinds, took their eggs, took them down to Bonneville Dam. And shortly thereafter, a few years, there were no salmon coming back. They didn't know that salmon went to natal streams. So in 1914, they tore that dam out, and the commissioner said, wonder of wonders, the salmon will be coming back. They didn't come back. Okay, Lewiston Dam on the Clearwater River. Well, before Lewiston Dam was built in 1917 and was taken out in 1973 when Lower Granite Dam was going to back water up over it. Grangeville Dam was built in 1910 on the South Fork of the Clearwater River without fish passage and was removed in 1963, and we'll come back and talk a little more about that. Plus, and Dwarshack, of course, was built in 1972. Dwarshack National Steelhead Hatchery produced steelhead, kokanee, and trout for the reservoir as mitigation, and later, as part of the Lower Snake Comp Plan, Chinook salmon were produced there. And uh, we'll hear more about Clearwater and other hatcheries from Jerry McGeehee. There were hundreds and hundreds of small and permanent and temporary irrigation diversion dams built on salmon spawning streams in the Snake River Basin. This is Sunbeam Dam. 1909 to the 1920s, there was no fish passage into the Stanley Basin, so all of those salmon runs then became extinct. There may have been kokanee left in some of those lakes that would have restarted the sockeye runs. From 1920s to 34, they had poor fish passage, and in 1934, Idaho Fish and Game blew a channel around it. To give you an idea, that's three people sitting on the dam of how big it was. Then Idaho Fish and Game poisoned out some of the Stanley Basin lakes to manage them for West Slope cutthroat, and evidently had second thoughts and brought some sockeye in from Canada. Okay, these are the four Lower Snake River dams. And I just want to briefly talk about the Wild, uh, Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, which is what uh, brings fish and wildlife mitigation to dam construction or any other uh, structures in the water. It's part of the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, uh, not the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, but structures in navigable streams are governed by the fish, the uh, 1999 Act. The Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act was first written in 1934, and some people have come with the opinion that it was written because Bonneville Dam was under construction. Bonneville Dam wasn't the first major dam on the Columbia. Rock Island Dam was, and the Corps had a finger in that too because they were involved in getting the fish passage there. Well, the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act had been amended a couple of times, but by the time Ice Harbor Dam was being considered, the Corps had asked the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act report. They provided one. For Lower Monumental Dam, while it was in planning, they asked for one. The Fish and Wildlife Service provided one. For Little Goose Dam was in uh, planning, the Fish and Wildlife Service provided one. In 1966, the Corps said, all four of these dams are having similar effects. Can you give us one report that defines all of the mitigation that's required? By the way, while all this was going on, the dams were being built and fish passage was being provided at the dams. Anyway, in 1966, the Corps asked for that report. I went to work in 1971 for the Corps and being a young whippersnapper, I asked Ray Oliger, who was the core biologist at the time, what was the status of mitigation. He said, we have these three reports, but we can't get a report back from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So I went home and took their three reports and picked out a version of it on my little portable typewriter and gave it back to uh, Ray. He sent it out to the agencies and they said, who the hell do you think you are telling us what we want? Okay. Well, I said, you know, we're trying to get the fish and wildlife mitigation going. So then in 1972, they pr 
1972 or three, they report, uh, provided a report for all four dams, and the Corps took those and had them analyzed by a uh, fisheries professor at the University of Washington and a wildlife professor at Washington State University, and they said, yeah, that's pretty good. So they put that Fish and Wildlife Compensation Plan together and sent it to the chief's office, and it sat under somebody's desk for about a year. And finally, after asking them where was it, they took it to Congress, and in 1976, it was authorized by Congress in the Water Resource Development Act of 76. And all it says, the Lower Snake River Compensation Plan is approved according to this report. That's all the authorization there was. But what came from that were, was the construction or modification of hatcheries, uh, fishery access, uh, wildlife mitigation areas, purchase of lands for wildlife mitigation. Oops. Okay, let's put this hatchery issue in perspective. These are the hatcheries that are producing salmon into the Pacific Ocean. Over here, Japan putting out 1.6 billion fish. Russia, 840 million. This one was the one that surprised me. Alaska puts out one and a half billion hatchery fish. 260 million, 147 million, 140 million out of the Lower Snake and Columbia. One of the things that surprised me about this, the reason why those numbers are so high is because a lot of those hatcheries produce pink salmon. Pink salmon, the eggs hatch, the, the uh, fry use up the egg yolk and they go into the ocean. So it's very cheap and easy to grow a lot of pink salmon. This is the uh, releases in the Columbia River above Bonneville Dam. Where do they come from? Fall Chinook, 43 million, 26 million spring summer Chinook, steelhead 11 million, and so forth. This one's kind of interesting. This is McCall Hatchery. There are a million summer Chinook produced in what used to be uh, Idaho Fish and Game Trout Hatchery. So, how do we operate these dams? for the betterment of fish. You all know about the spill program, and then I'm gonna tell you more about it. Flow augmentation and water temperature, I'll tell you more about. Juvenile fish transportation, Dan Caldwell will tell you about. Let's talk about spillway conditions first. When the dams were originally built, the water flowed down into the stilling basin, curled back on itself, and headed downstream. If you had spill that was going down in 50 feet of water here, you had 50 feet of, of atmospheric pressure on it, and uh, the water would become supersaturated with gas. What happens is the bubbles in the water are under pressure, and the gas goes out through the membrane of the bubble into, into uh, solution in the water and it becomes supersaturated. All eight core dams have spillways that the water flows under 40 to 50 feet deep. The water shoots out from under those gates at 35 to 45 miles an hour. There's an instantaneous pressure dip, uh, drop of one and a half atmospheres. The rapid expansion in trains air, air, it goes down into the stilling basin and is uh, goes into solution. If juvenile fish go under this, they're instantaneously uh, exposed to a, a pressure drop, and if they have gas supersaturation in their bloodstreams, it can boil out and come out in thin membranes or bubbles in the blood. In the 1970s, gas supersaturation was a big problem. The agencies were adamant that the Corps of Engineers had to reduce the gas supersaturation from spill. They tried to set the, set the standards at one and a half, or 105 percent, but water was coming out of Hell's Canyon at 108 percent, so they set the standard at 110 percent. 
Several years ago, the fish agencies decided that the system could be operated up to 120% without affecting the fish. I don't think that was a good idea, and neither did the people who were working on the problem in the 1970s. Then recently, they've said they can go to 125%. Well, I still don't think that's a good idea. I think it's a worse one. The thing I hadn't mentioned is this is head burn on a Chinook salmon, and a lot of fish that go over the dams will fall back through here and may be scalping themselves on the edge of that gate, or they have to go up a fish ladder with 100 steps and they may be scalping themselves going through orifices in the fish ladder. Either way, they're exposed to a fungus and may or may not live to spawn. The flip lips were installed to skate the water over the surface in the 1970s and one of the major, major, major uh, movements to end supersaturation was to minimize spill and use the flip lips. Once the flow gets above, above a certain level, it will go over the top of that flip lip back down into the bottom of the stilling basin. In the 19, late 1990s, our fish facility design committee uh, said, if the fish and wildlife agencies and the environmentalists are gonna want spill at the dams, let's at least make spill safe for the fish. So we came up with an idea of raising the weir up and letting it be an overflow down through. If that were to, the case with seven to 10,000 CFS going through here, there wouldn't have been a gas supersaturation problem. We thought we could build that out of concrete, but the chief's office didn't agree. They said it has to maintain the standard project flood and that would was 850,000 cubic feet per second at Lower Granite Dam. So they had to, had to design this thing so that it could be moved out of the spillway in case that never, never day flood came. So this is what it looks like when it's in position. They fill it full of water, it sinks and down into the, re into the reservoir and sits down here until they pump it full of air and bring it back up. This is what it looks like. This is what the flow looks like. Now think about the flow out of a lake into a river. This is what it looks like. And the fish know that, so that's why, why they instinctively go to these overflow weirs. And they're set five to seven times more effective than standard weirs. This is what one of those structures looks like. And this is the guy here who's probably six foot four, uh, $15 million. We thought we could probably do it for around two million if we use concrete. Well, the fishery agencies didn't think that was good enough. So at first they asked for what they call training spill on either side of that overflow spill to keep the uh, predator fish away from the fish coming down the overflow spill. And then more recently they've asked for spill up to 125%. This scale goes up to 109%. This is the water coming into Lower Granite Reservoir. This is the water going out of Lower Granite Dam. Here's the 110, here's the 120, and there's the 125, and it's spiked up in some places to almost 130. This is down at Ice Harbor Dam, the water that's coming into Ice Harbor Dam, and this is the water going out of the tailwater of Ice Harbor Dam. Gas supersaturation, like I said, goes into the water when bubbles are compressed and the gas is, is uh, dissolved into the water. In a rapid situation, it comes out relatively quickly because there are lots of bubbles and it's going out of the bubbles into the atmosphere. But in a reservoir situation, it maintains itself one, from one dam to the next. That means that the river is typically 125%, not only in the Snake River, but also in the Columbia River, all the way down to about Vancouver. I wanted to talk about pit tagging. Uh, pit tags are very small. 
Here's a picture of one here with a millimeter rule. And what they, def what they define, or what they really are, is a, a little tiny radio without a battery. It's a crystal that's wrapped in copper wire, and it's got a computer chip in it, and when it goes through a detector, it's hit with a radio beam, and this gives back a 10-digit alphanumeric code. And with 10 digits and 26 letters, you can have over 33 billion separate codes. All of the dams have pit tag detectors in bypass systems now. There are detectors in a lot of streams and rivers for fish that are released from hatcheries or tagged in the upper rivers and there are over two million tags put out per year. Up until 2020, the fishery agencies were estimating the number of fish going over the spillway. They couldn't measure it because they didn't have any pit tag detectors on the spillway. Now they do on the spillway on that one gate, but the other gates don't have them. <coughs> Lower Granite, Little Goose, and Lower Monumental each have eight gates, so there are seven gates without pit tag detectors. And there's one at Lower Granite, I think possibly two of them now, in the system that are on the spillway. So, what's happening with this spill program to uh, save the fish? This is the survival rate from 2021 of fish from Lower Granite Dam to Bonneville Dam. They didn't have one on Wild Chinook, but here you can see what it was, 64%, 42, 27, and 31. That's in-river survival. In the 1960s, and you'll hear more about this from Dan Caldwell, the National Marine Fisheries Service came up with a transportation program that gives over 98% survival. I want to talk about water temperature. This is uh, in the Snake River Basin. In the 1950s, uh, uh, well, I should clarify here, in 1992, uh, the Corps of Engineers was sued to uh, stop the gas supersaturation and uh, uh, stop increasing the water temperatures in the lower Snake River. I had a deposition in that case, and I went back into the uh, literature and found a study in the 1950s where at the mouth of the Snake River it was 83 degrees Fahrenheit. There are other studies uh, with high temperatures like that found by the University of Idaho later. Uh, the highest recorded temperature since Ice Harbor went in has been 77 degrees. Water from the Clearwater was coming down to the system at 75 degrees and from Hell's Canyon at 78 degrees. And I tracked that temperature downstream, down by dam, by dam, by dam, and it was obvious the hot water was coming out of Idaho into the Lower Snake, being passed downstream by those reservoirs. They were increasing temperatures, if any, very little. In the 1990s, the Corps was asked to spill water, cold water, from Dwarshack Reservoir to cool off the Lower Snake. And they've been doing that consistently since then and kept the Lower Snake River below 70 degrees. Like I said, oh, well, the state standards were set at 68%, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but they don't fit this natural pattern up here of hot water coming out of the upper clear water and coming out of uh, central Idaho. The Fraser River has undergone the same type of global uh, Columbia, same type of warming as the Columbia River many times in history. The Fraser River has no dams. Wrong way. This was the effect of warm water in 2015. 
I don't know if you remember, we had a big sockeye run that year, and a lot of sockeye died. A lot of fish pulled into uh, Drano Lake down on the Bonneville Reservoir and suffered fungal infections because of the hot water. This is 2015 in the Fraser River. This is one of the lakes of the Fraser River system and the dead fish that were found, which makes what happened in the Columbia River almost pale by comparison. So where's the hot water coming from? Okay, these are tributaries of the Snake River, uh, yeah, tributaries of Snake River at River Mile 453, then Malheur River, Payette, Weezer, and then down here just above, or just below Hell's Canyon. What about the releases from Dworshak? This is a graph, uh, USGS graph of the temperatures at Peck, Idaho. And you can see, oh yeah, to 2019, you can see the temperature was going up and then the cold water releases were made from Dworshak and the temperature at Peck was 56 to 50 degrees. That cold water comes down the clear water and meets the Hell's Canyon water at Lewiston. The cold water being colder goes underneath the hot water from Hell's Canyon. This is what it looked like down at Lower Granite Dam. The red up here is the hot water coming from Hell's Canyon. The purple here is above Orofino in the Clearwater River. And this is what was coming into Lower Granite, or, uh, yeah, the Lower Granite tailwater after this cold water was mixed in with it. Like I said, the hot water stays above the cold water all the way to Lower Granite Dam, and then it's mixed from there downstream and the Snake River has been maintained at typically less than 70 degrees since the 1990s. Another issue that came up was at Lower Granite Dam, fish were being blocked from coming into the fish ladder. That's because that hot water was flowing into the fish ladder exit right here and going down the ladder, and the ladder itself was quite a bit hotter than the tailwater below the dam, so the fish didn't want to go in. When Lower Granite Dam was built, it was built so that if there was a, never, uh, a big flood and it was going to overtop the, uh, rate, the uh, levees in Lewiston, the reservoir could be lowered 28 feet here at the dam. There was a slide to, for a bypass for the fish. One pump pumped water down the ladder, one pump pump ladder down the ladder high up, and the third pump was a false weir, so the fish would jump over it into that slide and go down into the uh, reservoir. The core converted that so that now that cold water is pumped up right in front of the fish ladder and goes down the fish ladder and has pretty much resolved that temperature blockage issue at Lower Granite and have done similar things at some of the other dams. I wanted to talk about the various types of fish facilities. Before I do, I wanted to mention this. These reservoirs now have a lot of invertebrates in them that have been brought in in barge water, or bilge water, or however, including mice's shrimp. We found mice's shrimp all the way down into McNary at least. Okay, the fish ladders. The fish ladders were designed in collaboration with the fishery agencies. When Bonneville Dam was built, the first fish ladders were 50 feet wide and ran 250 cubic feet per second, had a full weir overflow plus orifices. Over the years, that was refined up until uh, the construction of Ice Harbor Dam. There was a design that was uh, 16 feet wide, 10 foot pools, and took 75 cubic feet per second to operate. That way it made a lot more water available for power generation. Well, this is an ice harbor type fish ladder. Entrance here, entrance here. Fish go up, counting station there, they go into the reservoir. At the powerhouse, you have entrances here, one out into the stilling basin, 
and entrances across the face of the powerhouse and main entrances here into this ladder, counting station, and out into the dam. Juvenile fish passage lagged behind adult fish passage. It became a significant problem because of the gas supersaturation problem. So, in 1965, the National Marine Fisheries Service found uh, juvenile salmon in the gate wells at Ice Harbor and McNary Dams. Both those dams had ice and trash sluiceways that ran along the face of the dam where water could be spilled and the ice and trash could be uh, passed around the dam. Well, they drilled holes into those at Ice Harbor and McNary, and that was essentially the birth of the juvenile fish passage at the dam. John Day, Lower Monumental, and Little Goose were built with an embedded pipeline so that fish were passed out orifices into this pipeline and passed down into the tail rows, tail rays. This was supposed to simulate what those ice trash sluiceways were doing. But the orifices were six inches in diameter, clogged with debris, and that bypass system offered about 2% survival. Not good. So when they went to Lower Granite, National Marine Fisheries Service working with the Corps, designed a channel within the dam so that 12 inch, well, I think there were 10 originally, but 10 inch orifices could go into this channel and they could be bypassed around the dam. They also put another uh, gate slot or another Wagner horn, they called them, upstream so that they could be screened in closer to the surface of the reservoir. That worked very well, so the Corps of Engineers came back. Walla Walla District had a tunnel mined at Little Goose Dam, full length of the powerhouse, and at Lower Monumental Dam, and the Portland District had a, a tunnel mile, mined the full length of John Day Dam. So now we have a channel in here. The fish are coming out of orifices into that channel, into this flume, and here the extra water is taken off and put back into the adult collection facility. 30 cubic feet per second carries the fish down to the collection facility. Another pipeline of 30 cubic feet per second feeds the collection facilities, and they're collected here in raceways where they can either be trucked or barged downstream, or they can be bypassed back to the river. Okay, this is what the powerhouse looks like at Lower Monumental Dam, of what the, it's not just a big chunk of concrete. I mentioned that the tunnel was, was uh, mined for the bypass. The juvenile fish are deflected up through these uh, bulkhead slots into the bypass, excess water goes through a screen and back down through the turbine. On the, on the adult fish passage, extra water is coming through this channel, flowing in this channel. This is an orifice where along the face of the powerhouse, you have main entrances as well as those orifices so adult fish find their way into the fish ladders. Whoops. So now we have a measure of the juvenile survival going down through the system. This is based on uh, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, research. And this is the various survivals that the juveniles get coming through the dam. If they're passing through a normal spillway, in this study 17% did, had 95% survival. If they went over that surface passage weir, they had 100% survival, and it was seven to five to seven times more effective than fish going down under the spillway gates. Turbine survival, only 5% were passed through the turbines, 93% survival. Bypass survival, only 16% were screened out, 100% survival. The majority of the fish were being attracted over here to the spillway, so the overall survival, well, let me see, I think that's next. Yeah. Oh, before we get to that, I wanted to, to mention that uh, back in the 1980s, no, yeah, it was in the 1990s, 
happened to run into a guy by the name of Dirk Kempthorne. And he said, is that name familiar? He was your senator and so forth. He said, well, if you can make fish-friendly turbines, why don't you replace them all with fish-friendly turbines? That was in the 1990s. It took many, many years of research to develop a new turbine design that was more friendly to the fish than the old turbine design where the gates tilted uh, to change the flow and so forth. But the new ones tested out at 98.25%. So if they put those in all the way across the powerhouse, powerhouse survival would be substantially higher than it is now. So this is what it looks like going down through the system. With the, and this is based on National Marine Fishery Service studies. The survival rates by the spillway, 96, here's 97, 95, 95, 96, 97. Overflow weir. 98 to 100 percent. Powerhouse, the lowest was at Little Goose. Uh, improved turbine here at Ice Harbor. Screen bypass from 99 percent at Little Goose to 100 percent at the others. All of them met the biological opinion standard of 96 percent. But they're not being used as effectively because of the mass spill. Let's talk about adult survival for a moment. These are studies that were conducted by the University of Idaho in which they tagged Spring Chinook at Ice Harbor Dam with radio tags and tracked and passed radio tagging stations upstream. They did this over a four-year period, 99.2% survival from Ice Harbor to the spawning ground. If you take that and parse it out by what the survival per project is, it's 99.7%. In all the years that I was on the river, and I spent a fair amount of time out there, I saw two dead salmon. Okay, let's talk about the status of the salmon runs. The way this works, the upper number here is the lowest count at that dam. So this is the lowest count of Spring Chinook at Bonneville Dam. It happened in 1995 with those dams in place. The lowest, the lower Snake River dams in place. The ones in red are before the lower Snake River dams are, were in place. And you can see that 44 and 1960 were the lowest counts for uh, Summer Chinook and Fall Chinook at Bonneville Dam. Now look at the highest counts. The highest count at, when I made this graph was in 2001 at 439,000 Spring Chinook, 179,000 Summer Chinook, 1,064,000 Fall Chinook. We go up to Ice Harbor Dam, same pattern. These are all with those four dams in place. So you can see the highest counts have come with the lower Snake River dams in place. Lower Granite Dam, the DART program doesn't sort the Chinook out by, by uh, spring, summer, and fall. But here's the lowest count, was it 95? In 1995, at 3,702 fish, the highest count of Chinook over Lower Granite was in 1915 at over 203,000 fish. So we go upstream, or pardon, we change the other species. Same pattern here. These are the lowest count happened in 1945, the highest count in 2014, at the time I made this, it may be higher now. Uh, and the same here, sockeye. The sockeye count went to zero in 1994 at Ice Harbor Dam. In 1990, it was zero over uh, Lower Granite Dam. Coho, same sort of thing. Here, 2014 is the highest count. They were extinct in the Snake River from 86 to 93 before the Nez first started reintroducing them into the Clearwater and, and now uh, also into Looking Glass Creek. Coho. Lower granite, lowest counts, 84 to 96. Highest count, 21, 25,000. These are 
illustrating what was happening after the dams went in and what happened before. This is at Ice Harbor Dam. These are the counts over Ice Harbor Dam for sockeye salmon, uh, for Chinook salmon, steelhead, sockeye, and coho. The red box, if you remember, I mentioned it from 1977 till 1996, was a below average flow year in the Snake River Basin. Okay, let's look at uh, what happens with the Chinook when they get upstream. Let's say that a female has 5,000 eggs. Chinook fecundity goes as high as 15,000 eggs. That might have been it when you had those 110 pounders. But I'm using 5,000 eggs in this illustration. So, she lays 5,000 eggs. There's 90% fertilization. That gives you 4,500 eyed eggs. Egg to smolt survival, 5 to 10%. That'll produce 250 to 450 smolt. This is from research on the Lemhi River. Uh, survival to lower granite dam, about 50%. That'll give you 125 to 225 smolts. In river survival to Bonneville, let's say 50%. That'll give you 63 to 113 smolts. Transport survival, 98%, but under the current spill conditions, transport is 10%. So there are 13 to 23 smolts being transported downriver uh, at 98% survival. Estuary survival, again, 90%. So you have this number of fish that are surviving the estuary in river, this number from, uh, yeah, well, I, I lost myself. So ocean entry, 72 to 134 smolts. Ocean survival, 5%. 95% mortality in the ocean. And a lot of that comes from commercial harvest. One coated wire tag study on Lyons Ferry Fall Chinook indicated it was over 75% harvest. Typically now they say around 50%. So you have four to seven adults that are gonna come back to Bonneville. Survive to lower granite, 50%. That gives you two to four adults. And the SARs, are uh, 1.6 to 1.8 percent. This is a graphic that I made over the years showing what's happened since 1865, since the canneries first started. And here we have the Indian survival in blue, and it went down as the in river survival went up. What happened in 1910? Well, some of those gill netters got gasoline engines and not only could they get out in the ocean, but now they could get back. So that started the ocean harvest. And we've already talked quite a bit about that. 1945 was World War II, there was a real dip. And this is when Salilo Falls was inundated by the Dalles Dam. These are the years when the, the dams went in, 38, uh, McNary in 53, uh, the Dalles in 58, Ice Harbor 61, John Day 69, Lomo 70, Little Goose 71, uh, Lomo 69, 70, Little Goose and Lower Granite in 75. You notice here, what's the biggest impact affecting escapement is ocean commercial fishery. I couldn't find my old file, so I had to go to the dark and find out what happened since. This is total counts since 2009 up until 2023. All much higher. This is this peak here. I don't think smoke to adult return is a good measure of salmon survival. It's what the fishery agencies tribes use to judge survival in the hydropower system. Most of the numbers are estimated, not counted. Like I said, there are counters in all of the bypass systems at the dams. But one thing you need to know is that a three 
pit tagged fish go through a counter at one time, it won't get all three. Adult returns vary due to ocean conditions, and many of the adults, like I said, in some cases 75, some cases 50%, are harvested before they enter the river. And then, if the estimated runs are above what the agencies want for uh, escapement, they will open harvest from Bonneville Dam upstream and above Lower Granite Dam. When returns are high, harvest is increased, artificially lowering the SARs and increasing the criticism of dams. I think Idaho spawning ground counts are a much better way to measure. Uh, here we have the lowest in this data set of, in 1995, 2,327. Spring Chinook over Lower Granite, and they produced 270 red. The highest, 96,000 hatchery and wild Spring Chinook over Lower Granite, and they produced 6,500 red, reds. Natural spawners, 28,000 in 2015 over granite, produced 4,100 reds. In uh, 2015, 450 reds were found in the south fork of the Clearwater. You remember it was blocked by Grangeville Dam from 1910 to 1963, and the Lewiston Dam blocked most of the Chinook going upstream uh, from 1917 to 1973. Two-thirds of the spring Chinook and 85% of the fall Chinook spawning areas were above Hills Canyon complex. I'm going to get off the fish for a little bit and talk about some of the other reasons. People say, well, you know, we can replace that hydropower with, with uh, other green energy. Wind turbines, for example. One turbine at Lower Granite Dam puts out 135 megawatts. It takes 247 0.6 megawatt turbines to replace one turbine. There's a big cover up in the wind industry that you don't hear much about, and that is those wind turbine blades, and I suppose the uh, uh, housings are also made of composite materials like fiberglass can't be disposed of easily. And the reason why is because if they burn them, they give off toxic gas. So you can't pile them up and burn them. What do you do with them? This is the Casper Regional Landfill in Wyoming. It's one of the few places in the nation where they can dispose of wind turbine blades. This is a D9 cat burying those blades. So is that really the best alternative to hydropower that gives you reliable energy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days, 65 days a year? Solar energy. People say solar energy is a good replacement. If the sun shines, it produces. If the sun doesn't shine, it doesn't produce. But taking 3,000 watt panels it would take 450,000 of them to equal the production of one 135 megawatt turbine. So totaling these up, these are the megawatt turbines from each one, it takes for the four Lower Snake River dams, uh, which will, can at maximum produce about 3,030 megawatts, a million, 10,000, no, a billion, 10, 000, 10 million, uh, no. Okay. Get this right. 1 million, 10,000, 3,000 megawatt solar panels to replace the uh, capacity of the Lower Snake River. And cargo. Uh, a lot has been said about cargo and what we can replace the, the barges with trucks and railroads. Well, one barge equals 35 hopper cars. Uh, are 134 trucks. A barge tow made up of four barges is equal to 538 trucks or 1.4 trains. This means that instead of three, maybe four engines pushing a four barge tow and putting out pollutants, you have 538. Okay. 
questions later, how long did I go? Did I make it okay? Just remember to have to point this at the screen down there. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. It's a lot to digest, and I feel like sometimes like a dog watching TV. It's like way over my head. I, I think it would be good if we take a five or ten minute break. We're way ahead of schedule, but let's take a break to get up and stretch your legs, and we'll have the next presentation ready to go in, in about, let's say, ten minutes. Okay? Ten minutes, we'll be ready to go. This next presentation will be a tag team approach, if you will. And uh, I'll introduce them together. Um, and their topic is Sportsman's Historical Perspective of Salmon and Steelhead Runs. First, uh, I'd like to introduce Rus Rusty Bentz. Rusty attended Idaho State University and graduated from Boise State University in 1971 with a BA degree. Rusty, Rusty's journey as a fisherman and outdoor enthusiast and his special interest in steelhead salmon and their habitat since he was a small boy is truly inspiring. In 1999 he became a licensed outfitter and guide for steelhead and salmon fishermen. His life reflects a dedication to understanding the, de the delicate balance of ecosystems. The mention of low salmon and steelhead runs, nitrogen gas bubble disease underscores Rusty's awareness of the challenges these species face. His active learning about such issues showcase his dedication to being informed and a responsible steward and sportsman. Rusty's addiction to steelhead and salmon fishing reflects a deeper understanding of salmonoids and the rivers they inhabit. He has studied and visited most river systems in the western North American continent and visited most major rivers from Columbia to the Yukon by jet boat or airplane. Through his first-hand experiences, Rusty has become an invaluable source of knowledge about the habitat and habits of our steelhead and salmon. His passion for protecting these species for future generations is evidence in his lifelong commitment. His story serves as, as an example of how personal passion and dedication can lead to meaningful contributions. Would you welcome Rusty Benz? As Rusty... As Rusty comes forward, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Charles Pottinger. Born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at, he attended Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts, majoring in chemical engineering. He attended Pennsylvania State University, majoring in wood utilization, and the University of Minnesota, majoring in forest products, engineering and chemistry. He received a PhD at the Institute of Paper Chemistry in Appleton, Wisconsin. He was a research engineer for Potlatch Corporation, Potlatch Assistant Director of Research in Minnesota, Idaho, and Arkansas. In 1983, he became the Vice President of Operations. He retired in 2000 to become an avid salmon and steel fisherman. Would you also welcome Dr. Charles Pottinger. Rusty, here we go. Well, thanks for the kind introduction, Dave. Uh, I doubt that I live anywhere close up to the introduction. But anyway, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my life history. I was very lucky to have spent my entire life in this region. Well, we have three great rivers flowing through our backyards, the Salmon, the Snake, and the Clearwater Rivers. And the, coming back up each of these three rivers are a true wonder of nature, our anatomous fish runs. These fish start their life cycle in fresh water spend one to seven years in the case of steelhead in their native stream before migrating down the Snake River, the Columbia, and out into the ocean where they spend one to three years growing, 
Some of these fish go thousands of miles up into the Bering Sea before returning back down the coast of Alaska and Canada. And then somehow miraculously, they find the mouth of the Columbia and come up the Columbia and then up the Snake and up into our region. I caught my first steelhead, my first salmon, before I became a teenager. Thanks to friends and friends' fathers who had powerboats. How vividly I can recall those details of those two days, even all these years later, speaks to how important it was to me as a small boy to have these kind of experiences. I truly hope that generations, many generations that come after me can have these kind of experiences. When I was year I turned 21, I built my first riverboat and I've never been without one since. These boats have allowed me to explore these three rivers in great detail and to spend many hundreds of days out on the water, mostly in pursuit of our big fish. As Dave already indicated, in 1999, after, well, let me back up. In 1969, I guided for my first steelhead fisherman, or Chinook fisherman, a blow white bird fisher was returning to the hatchery at Rapid River. I guided off and on for outfitters through the years up until 99 when I got my own license. In 99, and I had an, uh, an area from Lewiston to Hell's Canyon Dam and from Lewiston to Whitebird. My acquisition of that license corresponded almost perfectly with what I call the great fish returns. And those fish returns happened from 2000 to 2015, nothing. that happened in the 20th century begin to compare with what happened in the 21st century. Up on the screen you can see a graph done by Dr. Pottinger and it shows that big increase 2000 to 2015. If you don't get any more out of my talk today then the fact we got far more fish back in the 21st century than we did at any corresponding time in the 20th century. This is an undeniable fact. This happened long after the completion of the Lower Granite Dam in 1975. To me, it proves beyond a doubt that we can have fish and dams. I'd like to look at another series of columns here. And the first column on the left covers a time period 1938 through 1947. 
This is the beginning of the post dam era with the completion of Bonneville Dam in 1938. Prior to that, we can only guess at what fish came back up the Columbia. And 1938 and through today, we've kept accurate counts of the numbers of fish and the type of fish coming back over to Bonneville. The second column to the right covers another 10 year period, 2000 through 2009. You can see by the totals that we got a lot more fish back in the 21st century. Three times the number of fish that came back in our beginning period. A 316% increase in fish. The two columns over to the right cover the same two time periods, but are for Spring Chinook. And we see a very similar pattern. We get a 268% increase in the 21st century. These numbers are all undeniable. If we wonder why we were able to have such large returns, the answer is hatcheries. As John explained, we've lost 60% of our natural spawning habitat for steelhead. We lost two thirds of our natural spawning habitat for spring chinook, and we've lost up to 80% of our habitat for fall chinook. But these hatcheries have been able to produce enough offspring that they have made more than made up for that natural spawning habitat. If we look in the second column of figures, we see that in 2001 and again in 2009, we got over 600,000 adult steelhead returning back over Bonneville. This was five times what it was the pre dam era when we had an average of 127,000 fish. If we look a little deeper into what caused these numbers. Well, first of all, we have to realize that our steelhead come in two varieties. The so-called A-run steelhead that come back after one year in the ocean and our B-run steelhead that come back after spending two years in the ocean. B-run steelhead are bound almost exclusively for two rivers in Idaho, the Clearwater River, where the majority of the steelhead run is made up of bee run fish. The other river is the Salmon River, which has a larger component of A runs than it does B runs, but it still has a sizable number of B run fish coming back. About 40 years ago, we started clipping the adipose fins off of our smolts and our hatcheries. This enables sportsmen to tell the difference between a hatchery fish and a wild fish. A hatchery fi fish they might be able to keep. In the case of the Snake River, all wild seal had to have to be turned loose and have for a lot of years. 
So, Aaron fish that make up two thirds to three quarters of the run coming back to Bonneville as opposed to B runs. So the majority of still had to return after one year. When we look at those two big run years, 2000 and 2009, if we want to understand what brought those fish back, we look back to 2000 and 2008. According to my research, in the year 2000, we barged 95% of the steelhead out of the four bay at Lower Granite Dam. And in 2008, we barged 83% of the steel head smolts out of the four bay at Lower Granite Dam. These are the two biggest barging years ever, according to my research, from the Four Bay of Lower Granite Dam. And the connection to the huge returns is undeniable. Barging gets our fish below Bonneville with a 98.5% survival rate. If we leave them in the river, we get anywhere from a 20 to 60% survival rate, far lower. And the evidence is plain. Why is barging so effective? There are three things that it's effective against gas bubble diseases that John's already talked about and Jerry McGee he's going to talk about even more a subject that they're certainly far more expert on than I am fish predation that is the reservoirs below Lower Granite the seven reservoirs are all filled with bass and walleye that prey heavily on those fish and avian predators that really have an effect once they're down to the estuary area. Those of us that live in the Lewiston Clarkson Valley have seen a huge increase in the last decade in white pelicans coming back. Fifteen years ago, I had never seen a pelican up here. And now we have hundreds of them. The an adult pelican can eat up to seven pounds of smolts a day. We can see the effect of predation from Lower Granite Dam to Hell's Canyon Dam, we have a section of the Snake River that gets quite warm. This river section is great habitat for bass. The same goes for the salmon, Lower Salmon River from it's mouth to Riggins. Same goes for the Grand Round River. From its mouth to Troy, Oregon. The same goes for the full length of the middle fork of the Clearwater River. No smolt can get from a hatchery or its wild spawning area without going through one or more of these rivers that are heavily infested by bass. The U.S. Geological Survey and the Nez Perce Tribe operate a small release site at Pittsburgh Landing on the Snake River. 
their research shows that they lose half of those smolts before they get barely 30 miles down the river to the mouth of the Salmon River due to bass predation. When we put those fish in a barge, obviously, no bass can get to them and no avian predators. That's why the survival rate is so high getting to Bonneville. Joe DuPont and others in his staff have written a paper, published 4 9 of 2020. And in that paper, they find that steelhead are better off being barged 80% of the time. With the remaining 20% of the time, being neutral, that is, they're just as well off being barged as they are left in the river. When we moved to Spring Chinook, they're better off being barged 60% of the time, with 40% of the time being neutral. One of the most interesting studies done that points to the effectiveness of barging happened on the Walla Walla River. In the later 70s, there's a steelhead hatchery on the Walla Walla River. And in that hatchery, they raised about 700,000 fingerling steelhead. When these fish started smolting and were ready to migrate, they took half of them, put them directly in a truck out of the hatchery, and hauled them down to a waiting fish barge below the mouth of the Walla Walla River and the Snake River. After they acclimated them for a few days, they took them down well below Bonneville and turned them loose. They let the other half go out into the Walla Walla River naturally, pass down through the Walla Walla of the Snake and the Columbia. The result was that coming back to Bonneville, the transported fish came back 11 times greater not 11%, but 11 times greater. This is a huge number difference. In 2018, we see that for steelhead out of the four bay or granite dam, We barge 62% of our wild fish while only barging 48% of our hatchery fish. The result of that is in 2019, we got back equal numbers of wild fish to lower granite that we did hatchery fish. Never since we've been releasing large numbers of smolts out of our hatcheries if we ever got a 50% return of wild fish. I would argue that barging is a reason for that. I'd like to go back now to Dr. Pottinger's graph.
and we see that we started a very sharp decline after 2015. What happened that we should have this huge decline? The answer is partly what Mother Nature gave us. In 2015, we got a very hot and early summer. And the waters behind the four reservoirs in the Columbia, the lower reservoirs, got very hot. And as hot water was going down the spillways, and sockeye salmon, which Washington had been so successful at getting a sockeye return to go back up the Columbia in large numbers and go back to lakes in Washington and British Columbia, died by the thousands. That death caused the environmental community to sue Noah, and they got this Judge Simon to be the sole arbitrator of how we manage our fish. It was a common belief among fishery managers that spill was a preferred method to get fish downriver. So in 2016, Judge Simon ordered spill. Well, 2016 turned out to be the opposite kind of year is 2015 weather-wise. And we had a high snowpack with a lot of natural runoff. Spilling all this water over the spillways of the dam made it difficult to count the fish that were going out. John pointed that out. But Noah reported that while they didn't have the exact numbers, they were sure that it was far below the previous years. Judge Simon believed that he had not ordered enough spill, and that was a reason for the disaster in 2016. In 2017, he doubled down and ordered even more spill. 2017 turned out to be another year like 2016, with a hot lot of runoff. Noah reports that it was the worst out migration ever recorded up to that time. Fortunately, they took the authority away from Judge Simon and gave it to a committee. We saw uh, in a previous slide that that committee allowed more bargings, 62% of the wild fish out of the foray at Lower Grand Dam, which is a pretty good barging number if you look back over the history. And they had less spill. We, as you can see by Dr. Potter's graph, we started getting an uptick in numbers. But in 2021, we have a biological opinion that says spelling is a preferred way to get our fish down the river. When this came out and I read it, I predicted that it was going to be a disaster. And we didn't have to wait very long to see what kind of a disaster it is. The first class of fish coming back from that 2021 out migration is our A run fish that come back in 2022. Instead of being two thirds to three quarters of the 
run at Bonneville, they only comprise 7.9% of the run. Obviously, our steelhead smokes didn't like, like what they were doing. This spring, we get our second look at fish coming back from 2021, and, and that's with our spring and summer Chinook. Based on jack counts from 2021, they expected a reasonable return of fish in the lower Columbia. And Washington and Oregon opened their light, er, season up for catch and keep season. But the run soon collapsed and they had to have emergency closures to keep the numbers of returning fish to drop, from dropping below the hard established escapement numbers set by the Endangered Species Act. If we come forward to this summer, we're starting to see returns of our steelhead. Those would be the B runs coming back from 21 and the A runs coming back from 22. We had a similar situation in 22 as to 21, and both Washington Fish and Game Departments and Oregon Fish and Game Departments are publicizing we should be prepared for a steelhead run that's the lowest since 1938. As a sportsman, I find this kind of management unacceptable. It's plainly not working. It didn't work in other years, gas supersaturation disease is a major killer. A lot of fish managers believed that hatchery fish mixing with our wild fish caused unfair competition. And they put pressure on Oregon State University to do a study, a study that was completed in 2009. And sure enough, Oregon State said that hatchery fish were inferior genetically and that their offspring were inferior. As a result, both Washington and Oregon cut back on their hatchery programs. And in the case of the Grand Round River that flows through both states, they made it illegal to catch a hatchery steelhead and not kill it. They started putting weirs across, all three states did, putting weirs across natural spawning streams and killing every hatchery fish that dared return or go up those streams. Fortunately, this year, we get a much more in-depth study, one done by the Dallas Institute, led by Ian Coltier. He studied the same thing that Oregon State did in the Dalles River, where he studied steelhead, and in Johnson Creek, where he studied returning Chinook. He found no evidence of inferiority among the hatchery fish returning. In fact, he said, it only helps our wild fish population. Last month, we get a second study. This one done on Looking Glass Creek, which is a tributary of the Grand Round in Oregon. 
And that study even found the same thing as Coltier's study. That hatchery fish weren't allowed to spawn with wild fish enhanced the wild fish numbers. If we look at the wild fish component, 2000 to 2009, we can get an idea of what the wild fish component was coming back then. Because at that point, they were counting wild fish as a subset of the total returning steelhead numbers. That number turns out to be, a, over a 10-year period, 117,000 wild fish came back. That's over 92% of the original run coming back in 1938 through 47. If we lost 60% of our steelhead habitat, you would expect that wild fish that depended on the habitat would also decline by 62% or 60%, excuse me. Maybe not exactly, but there should be some correlation. They, it shouldn't, we should not have been getting that high wild fish component. And I would argue that these last two studies are a reason for that large wild fish component that we all applaud. So what happens if we take out the four lower Snake River dams? This is my opinion. One thing we know for sure is that we're going to lose our smoke collection facilities and our ability to get those fish below Bonneville with a 98.5% survival rate. And a study some years ago by the Corps of Engineers. They said a wild seal had put in a barge at Lower Granite and taken down the river, had a 100% better chance than one left in the river. Barging not only helps hatchery fish, it also, by the same factors, help wild fish. It would seem to me like we'd much more likely to have an extinction event if we take out those dams and we lose our ability to barge than we would if we left them in place. Of the 13 populations of threatened and endangered steelhead populations that we have in the Columbia River, only four of them are, are in the snake. One is our cohos, and John's figures show how dramatically we've been able to increase those sockeye numbers in the last few years. Granted, 2015 was tough on them. 2015 was a very warm, hot water year. And that glob that John put up, the graph of that, was a problem for most of our fish in the ocean. But let's see if I can find it. What did I do? <laughs> okay, right there. And Noah reports that in 2021, 
West Coast ocean conditions in less than 24 years. This covers the two great years of fish returns we got, 2001 and 2009. We should be getting large numbers of fish back, but instead, we're seeing a collapse of our fish runs. We've long allowed dam removal advocates to control the narrative. Somehow I hope we can reverse this trend because it's pretty plain to me they're severely damaging our fish. I want to thank you guys for coming today and I want to thank you for listening to my talk. Good morning. My name is Charlie Pottinger and I am going to try to uh, put everything we have, we've presented so far in a little uh, better perspective or simpler perspective to sort of grasp. It's a lot, we've been firing a lot at you. So I'm going to try to give you a, a history of the Columbia River Basin uh, from way back when, when the only reason we can even talk about it is we heard a lot of stories about it and how wonderful it used to be. And then we'll talk about what happened after the uh, 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 this thing's not changing. After the uh, uh, Nez Perce Treaty in 1855, shortly after that, the settlement of this part of the country really took off, and uh, we had. Uh, uh, the canneries and the uh, uh, things that man has done to the river. So I need to, if I can get that graph of the, I want you to first to imagine, this is, this is not working. I want you to imagine there's no, nothing on there but blue. Take off all, all those dots off. That was the river before settlement people started to, to play with it uh, over time. And uh, the Columbia River Basin uh, is a huge drainage. It drains about 250,000 square miles of parts of British Columbia, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and, and, and some from Wyoming. The main stem Columbia flows Let's see if I can do this thing. Yeah, the main stem Columbia originates up here in British Columbia and then flows down through central Washington. And that's an important spot right there. And right there is the Oregon border and then it flows on over to, to uh, uh, the Pacific Ocean west of Portland. And we all know that. And at this point right here, the Great Snake River enters the Columbia and it flows some 1,100 some miles out here. And as you went up the Snake River in the, in the golden days before we started tinkering with them, those fish could make it all the way to Shoshone Falls, as John pointed out. Well, now let's take a look at and and if you look at if you look at this whole area, the whole Columbia River Basin, any any uh, stream that could be reached and had an adequate flow in it and had good conditions for spawning, they were all habitat that was available to the to these fish. And back in those days, they estimate that we were uh, seeing uh, prior. This would be prior to the treaty, like for instance five to 16 million fish a year. That's what experts have, have deduced by trying to figure out what happened long ago when there really wasn't any data. 
So, you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting numbers, big numbers. Right now, we're seeing something like 2 million fish a year. So we've had a big decline from maybe, I don't know, someplace between 5 and 16 down to 2 million fish a year. That decline started not when we started building dams. It started when we started canning fish. And we, we, we canned a lot of fish between 1850 and, 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 and the present, and, and it really uh, reduced the returning fish population to the so-called two million level by the, by the time we got into the 1930s. And so we, we, uh, we have learned that uh, the first time we ever knew how many fish were coming up into the Columbia Basin, and I'm talking about the Columbia Basin above Bonneville Dam. There, you're, you know, Willamette and, and there's good tributaries south of the, or west of Bonneville that have a spawning habitat as well. But when they come over Bonneville Dam, every fish that spawns in every river upstream is counted at Bonneville Dam. And so in 1938, we, we, we put Bonneville Dam in and we began fish counting. Another important thing we need to understand is, now we're going to see all these dots materialize, but we have Grand Coulee Dam. That was under construction in 1938, and in 1938, it reached the point, and the way they were building it, that the fish were no longer allowed to, to bypass or, or to get above Bonneville. So we lost all the or Grand Coulee. We lost any spawning area that naturally existed up here in that whole area in 1938. Shut it off forever. No salmon or steelhead ever came out of there after 1938. And so, so we started with the dams. There, that is an impenetrable dam. And since then, we, went, we moved over and built Chief Joseph Dam, which is also has no, no fish ladder. So from Chief Joseph all the way up into this area, gone forever. Then we, in, in, you know, we started building dams in uh, uh, 38, and we built, since 38, we've built all of these dams, eight dams between Lewiston and uh, 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 the sea. Those dams all have fish ladders, and, and it's, it's we, we have the numbers for all this time. And uh, I'm going to flip to this next graph, and then I'll flip back to the map. No, oh, it's not working. Oh, okay. Okay. The, uh, the, the next thing, the most important thing to notice is, you, as you come, if you come across... As you come across to all these years, we've got lots of variation in the, in the numbers of steelhead and salmon, and these are all spring chinook numbers and salmon. But there's no there's no no evidence of a downward decline as we added dams. We 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 built all these dams in this period of time, from from 1975 to 1938. And there was no evidence of a, of a decline in fish returns. The adult fish are coming up over those dams just like they did in 38. So, so then, then we started in 19, I think it was 1962, we built the, uh, uh, we built dams at, uh, can we go back to the map? Yeah. In 1962, we, were, we weren't uh, satisfied with just losing all this spawning area up here, habitat, all habitat, gone. So we decided we would block the Hell's Canyon Dam down here, Hell's Canyon. We built Brownlee and then Hell's Canyon and then, then Oxbow. But it doesn't make any difference. All three are impenetrable. No fish ladder. And we have, we have 
hatcheries to mitigate for those dams, but the numbers of fish or the habitat lost is everything, all of this up to Shoshone Falls, it's all gone. And that was a big part of the uh, salmonoid hatchery habitat of the Columbia River Basin. Then to top it all off, in 1963, we built the Dorshak Dam and lost all of the, of the uh, North Fork of the Clearwater River permanently. Those dams, if we removed them, they might increase habitat. Removing the four lower Snake River dams, they do not block access to any tributary stream in that reach that was available before they were built, it's still available. And there was not that much in that area. So taking out the four Snake River dams isn't going to give you a, a significant increase in the uh, spawning habitat for wild fish. So we have, we have lots of hatcheries to mitigate for that. We'll go back to the, to the fish to the graph. The, the most important metric that we should be watching for how we're doing on managing our fish is how many fish come back. That's the most important thing. And the way you get more fish back is to send more fish to the ocean. That's, that's pretty clear. So it, a point to remember is that since 1938, addition of dams did not change the upriver flow of adult fish. And that's, that's what we're measuring from, from 38 until 2000. Then the question is, what happened? What in the heck went wrong in 2000? Is that from 1977 to 2000 is a, a development period for technology of barging. By the late 1990s, we had developed barges and, and enough barges to really have a significant impact on it. And they started using it as much as they could. And what happened? Dang. We got an upward, I can't, this thing don't, yeah, there you go, look at that. These are big numbers compared to what was happening before. And what we changed was transportation. And uh, we, we can see that the, that the fish, adult fish make it up the river fine. Barging gets the juvenile fish down the river fine. And we, we have to uh, understand that the four lower Snake River dams do not black act access to spawning habitat. The adult fish make it, the adult fish bound for the Snake River come over Bonneville, and most of them make it to over Lower Granite Dam. And then they have access to all the available habitat. If you're spawning wild fish, you gotta find the habitat and use it. If you go to the hatchery, you go to the hatchery. But the, the adult fish get to over Lower Granite Dam, and unless I catch one of them, they'll make it to the, to the uh, uh, successful spawning area. And the way to get more adult fish is clearly to use barging. Biologists at dam operations, many others, have, have decided that, that uh, they would rather see spill. I have no idea why that makes sense to anybody. The uh, uh, spilling is a uh, is known to produce forty to sixty percent survival in down migrating smolts, whereas ninety eight plus percent is achieved if you can barge them. And uh, so, you know, I guess the choice is, if you look at it from a, a fish expert's point of view, is, well, it, 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 we're going we're to lose half the fish if we put them over the dams by spill. 
But that's still better than having 98% of them survive by barging. So I guess it leads us to some real big questions. Why do environmental groups push for more spill, knowing that it increases smoke mortality? I don't have the answer to that. Why have certain influential interests pushed to ignore fish return data, which shows that more transportation barging increases returns of both wild and hatchery salmonoids? Adult fish are very successful in reaching the remaining spawning areas above Lower Granite Dam, but they, 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 uh, uh, Um, so what I was going to say was they're very successful in getting above Lower Granite Dam. So removal of those dams is not going to do anything to help the adults because they're making it now, and it does and it does nothing to increase access to additional spawning habitat. And spawning habitat is the thing that has reduced the fish more than anything else. So removal would also dam generated funds, which we have used a lot of that money for hatchery operations, which are critical to the uh, health of these fish runs. So why not use adult fish returns as the key metric? Uh, this is a question. Why not emphasize barge transportation when we can clearly see it is superior to the spill? Why not seriously act to reduce predation of smolts and, and adults fish? And we're having a real problem with our walleyes and bass, and, uh, and then we've got avian predation. I like to go to the roosters when the pelicans are fishing out there you can look out the window and watch them catch smolts. It is, it is amazing. And so maybe 50 or 60 of them out there. Why not stress habitat improvement over dam removal? I mean, there is, uh, I think the Nez Perce are more active in, in uh, habitat uh, improvements and trying to uh, induce new runs of fish. Why not increase fish returns and have the benefits of the dams by using barging? I think it's uh, uh, evident that if we use what we know and we, and we experiment with things that work and, and, and work to optimize those, such as barging and using different methods of barging, more barges, there's all kinds of ideas. We can have more fish and dams and the benefits of both by increasing transportation. Thank you very much. Again, it's evident uh, just uh, before I forget Marilyn Scharnhorst is here and, and helping us that are over 60 with the, with the technology here. So thank you to Marilyn because we need her. <laughs> Dan, you're kind of in an awkward position. You're the final presenter before lunch. So, uh, but he has some exciting things to share with us. Can I just introduce Dan Caldwell? His topic is fish barge transportation equal 98% 90 smoke survival rate. Dan earned an AA degree at Shasta College in Redding, California, a BS degree in production agriculture from Chico State University, and an MS degree at Extension Education from Washington State University. In 2004, Dan was hired by the U.S. Geological Survey as a biological technician with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Columbia River Research Lab in Cook, Washington. Dan was trained in smolt tagging, fish ID, and boat operations, including smoke identification, worked at many dams in the next eight years, installing fish telemetry receivers, dam tail race boat, GPS recovery, spill research, smoke release operations for out-migration research, 
and other requirements regarding smolt research. Dan joined the Army Corps of Engineers as a fish transport barge specialist. Dan prepared to maintain barges and was responsible for the safety of millions of salmon and steelhead smolts in a healthy, acclimated water environment, free of predation and time delays as they passed the remaining seven dams to the estuary below Bonneville Dam. When barging was complete each season, Dan worked in the separator at the juvenile fish facility at the Lower Granite Dam, continuing the fish monitoring process at the facility. Please welcome Dan Caldwell. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. When this was all coming together, I asked Dave, I said, how she you dress? He says, dress like you would go on a Sunday morning. My Sunday mornings are tank tops, shorts, sandals, probably a shooting vest, shotgun, or an efficient pole. So I had to change things up a little bit today to be with you folks. Um, talk a little bit about fish transport today. Talk a little bit, you know, there's some people at WSU and I was there made their career out of acronyms. USGS uh, is a strange acronym, stands for U.S. Geological Survey, you might wonder why that particular thing has to do with fish. Well, they sponsor a lot of things in this world, and um, they did that at this uh, Cook, Cook Station, and they managed that whole research station at Cook, Washington. Um, and it's a training station for season tagging and spill, uh, telemetry receivers, spill patterns, those kinds of things, and it's all done there. Um, Rice Island, which is down below Central Ferry, had issues with rabbits. We put out miles and miles of coax cable for receivers down there, and the rabbits ate all the cable up, so then we had to put in a whole bunch of PVC to make that work. Um, funding stopped and laid off a bunch of folks from Cook, and so enter USAEC, United States Army Corps of Engineers, a barge rider and separator opportunity. Everybody gets some idea that, oh, wow, you're riding a barge down the river. It's all fun. And you can see the environment and enjoy the weather, and it's cool. It's probably one of the most sleep-deprived jobs I've ever had in my life, if you do it correctly. And uh, I did it. <laughs> I did it correctly. That's why I'm here. So here we go. New paper sticking together. Okay. Will this work? Yeah. Okay. Here's a little outline of the of the uh, facility. You can see this at the visitor center at Lower Granite Dam. So over here is where the barges are stored during the winter, and, and then you'll see some more of this. And this is the lock, and this is the spillway, and right here is where that RSW, which is called. Um, a, a spill weir, removable spill weir, and this is a powerhouse. And like John was saying, that happened over at uh, at uh, Lower Monumental. That's all been mined out inside there now. Actually, went in in the middle of the night with jackhammers and, and wheelbarrows, and they mined out the inside of that channel. And they only had 12-inch orifices for the water to go through in the fish, and they're up to 14 inches now, and they've got cameras on them. A lot, of, a lot of less debris issues in that whole area. And then it goes around through this flume area, comes down, and we'll talk about that a little bit. This is the outfall pipe for anything that gets bypassed, doesn't go through the facility. And then this is a tug with a barge at the fish facility, and that's where it's loaded. All right, this is how the transportation system works out of these four dams. Nothing's coming down from the Columbia River anywhere at all. It all starts at granite, and granite can go one of four ways here. They can go to Goose, they can go to Lower Monumental, and they can go to McNary. They load barges at, at granite, and then we pick up more on the way down at Goose, and then we swing into um, Lower Monumental. There's no facility at Ice Harbor, and we used to go to McNary, but when you come out of the lock, you have to cross all the way across the spillway and it was too great, you couldn't get across there. You'd have to shut the spillway off to get there. 
So that fish facility now is trucking everything down below Bonneville and their, and their operation. So that's how the transportation thing works. But we go, and then when we get down to low numbers, you'll see we don't even barge any longer. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. There we go. All right, so fish have been transported a lot of ways, to mountain streams by horseback. I'm going the wrong way. Sometimes they put them in a backpack. People have packed them up in the hills that way. Drop them out of airplanes in high mountain lakes. They go in head first and do quite well. This thing is not cooperating with me. The battery go dead and that thing? Oh, well, that's the one I was using. Okay, well anyway, sometimes a kid from a fair will get a, throw a ping pong ball into a puddle and end up with a bass or a little rainbow or a guppy goldfish and take it home. So lots of ways. I wish that would work better. Yeah, you want to run them? All right, do that. Go to the next one. All right, great. Now, I was working for USGS. And this is down at Goose. We would work up fish in the, during the day, and then they'd go into a recovery area in five-gallon buckets with water all the time for the night. And then the next morning, we would put those buckets in these trailers, and, uh, and we had oxygen on the, on the pickup. These things all were wrapped in foil and kept cool, and sometimes when it got really hot, we would have frozen river water that we'd put in to keep the temperature correct. But we used this, and we transported them to various uh, release sites, some at Central Ferry and some down below, uh, down below Goose. And we released them twice a day, one at 10 o'clock in the morning and one at 11 o'clock at night. And we did that around the clock while the outfall was going on. The four purposes of the barging were to reduce migration delay, eliminate predation, eliminate mortality at subsequent dams, and avoid deadly gas supersaturation, which you've heard a lot about. And one thing I want to comment on the way through this thing, I left down there in 2015 was my last time, and the improvements that have been made and the benefit and behalf of the fish are absolutely incredible, and I'll show those to you. All right, now, next. Going down on the barge was fun in some aspects, okay? You see a lot of things. I took several pictures here I'm just gonna share with you quickly. Things that I saw that were just kind of caught my eye. This was a bunch of rock outcroppings that looked like morel mushrooms, and so I just took a picture. The next one is called a fire rainbow. This is a very, it's called a circumhorizontal arc. It's very, very rare. I happened to catch this one afternoon down at Goose. I looked up and saw this thing, and. It can only be witnessed when the sun is at least 58 degrees above the horizon and ice crystals face uh, running through parallel to the ground. It only happens on very rare occasions and we were quite, uh, quite uh, pleased. It just took a picture of it and, and turned out quite well. Next. And this one, if you look at it closely, it looked like one of those beanies people put on and on their head and so forth. But if you look at it closely, you'll see an outline that look like a duck here. And it just happenstance. I didn't see that until after I got the picture taken. So anyway, that's one of the serendipities of, of the ride down there. And kind of a neat little program here, Mount Hood in the, in the morning going down. And you can see John Day Dam in, in the distance there. We're coming up on it. These are some of the peaceful moments. And then sometimes that changes. This is coming back one morning. The barge of wheat coming out as we were coming out and had this this gorgeous sunrise. So these are some of the really neat things that you just pick up for all the years that we spent on it. Okay. And then there's this. This is what happens when the water comes up and the wind comes up at the same time. At this moment, I was in the barge shack where we keep all of our instrumentations and stuff from the engines. 
and it wasn't even safe to go out on the on the deck of the barge at that point because it was incredible that way. And this happened frequently, mostly down below the Don, the John Day, no, below uh, the, the Dalles Dam. Um, that's pretty cool. Okay, next. All right. In 1968, a system for collecting and trucking juveniles around the dams began. The adult returns from this program, they showed pretty positive. The system was limited to the carrying capacity of a truck fleet where they had 17,000 gallons on the truck and, and then there was a, a fish limit of 10 pounds per gallon and so we ended up with 17,500 smolts and that's about all you could do. Um, okay. This is one of the new trucks that's down there now. It's a, it only has 17,000 gallons, but it's, it's a far cry from the other ones that had generators and aeration tanks and stuff that made some noise. These things are pretty sophisticated. Next. And this is a smaller one. When the numbers get down, you can run a smaller truck and then not have to run the barges and that sort of thing. Um, okay. All right, 1977 was the lowest snowpack year. Uh, resulted uh, great delay, out migration was terrible. If a large scale transportation program, i.e. barging, had not been implemented, the molt, smolt mortality would have been catastrophic. The two barges that were used in 1977 were leased paper mill barges. They cleaned them up a little bit and tried to make them work. They were modified and they kind of worked. Then they picked up two army water surplus barges that were used in World War II. They actually filled them full of water and drove them across the Pacific so the troops would have fresh water. And they were the first that came into the series in 19, 1978. As I mentioned before, there's been many improvements to enhance the safety and security of the fish. Again, in 2001, extreme low water year caused agencies and tribal representatives to fear a massive fish loss until they were reminded that over 90% of the smolts had been transported. All right, now we show the barges. Okay. All right, there's three types of barges, 2000 series and 78, a 4000 series, and you'll see all these in a minute, 81 and 82, and, a, and uh, 1990 they had 8000 series barges, you'll see all these in a minute. This indicated that the Army Corps of Engineers and the biologists down there were absolutely serious about the fish's well-being. Okay, this is the, the uh, storage area, the old storage area. And these are the 2,000 barges here. And this is the 8,000 barge and 8,000 barge. And then there's two 4,000 barges over here. So these were the first ones they had that were the Army Corps things. And uh, they had uh, pumps and, and they had a system that was a splash system I'll talk about in a minute. A uh, 2,000 series barge is 130 feet long and 32 feet wide. It has the capability of hauling 220,000 fish in one load um, and with a documented survival rate of more than 98% again. The 4,000 series barges, you see a little better picture of them in a minute, are these over here. They not only have uh, their own engines to pump this sort of thing as well, but they have air compressors and, and generators on them so you can run your air things so you can dump them. And they're 150 feet long, 34 feet wide and their capability of hauling 400,000 fish in a trip. This water is pumped over this uh, reoxygenation and maybe a degasifying operation that's in these tanks. I'll show them to you in a little bit. And it kind of re it reduces that total dissolved gas. The current action spill, you've heard just a bunch, reduce the percentage of juvenile transport at 125 is somewhat harmful. All right, the 8,000 series barges are patterned after the 4,000 series. They're capable of almost a million fish, 750,000 fish. That's depending on the size of the fish. You can get 10 fish in a, in a gallon kind of a consideration now, but sometimes it'll be anywhere from 13 to 23 fish, depending on the size of them in a, in a, in a pound. And uh, when we talk about pelicans eating them, that's a bunch. They have a similar oxygenation system and uh, they uh, do the same thing as they go down. Now these systems are all monitored very closely all the way down. This is where that sleep deprivation thing comes in. Uh, biotechs, the fisheries have degrees or experience in fish handling operations. And oxygen and temperature readings are taken every two to four hours. 
and, and recorded, and, and then any mortalities are, uh, are reported and identified, and that's reported at the end. That's how can we know that 98% or greater than 98% is, is working that way. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, hang on a second. All right, this is the new docking area, and this was the old one I just showed you. Okay, next slide. And here's what it looks like over here. Now we can back into them, and they all got these hoists and stuff, and it's even better than that now. Uh, and, and you can change motors, and you can change pumps and stuff, and so go back to the, ex, the other slide. Can you? Out here, you had to go out on this dock here, and then you had to hand drop everything off cross there. It was kind of difficult. Okay, next. So these, are, these, are, these aren't turned around yet, but they will be at the end. So everything is backed in and, and they have a spot for every one of them. And in this way, they, more, they actually had to dig this out a little bit because it wasn't quite deep enough. Okay. This is the back of a 4,000 barge. And you can see they, had a, they added a new generator and an air compressor. And I'll show you the value of the air compressor in a minute. It's tied up to another one because this one's loaded with fish and this one's going down to be parked at Goose and then they'll, they'll direct load down there. Okay. This is the barge shack where we kept track of all our records and stuff. This all changed in there a little bit. You used to have a deal in there, and this now they have a actually have a file cabinet. And this is this uh, tool box has gone out of there, but this is where we stayed and took care of all of our records and everything. And the motors and stuff are just behind that. Next, this is the engine compartment. Some of these got Detroit, some of them got uh, Caterpillar engines, and. Um, these are the shafts that run to these pumps and underneath all of this is a sea chest and the water coming in there is at this 120 or 25 percent uh, saturation level coming in and then it's pumped by these pumps next one and it goes into these oxygen aeration chambers inside these things are a bunch of like a little bunch of wiffle, wiffle balls and water gets pumped at the top of those and goes down through those and when it does that, it ends up entering this fish hole where the fish are at about 103% oxygen, or DVG. So it reduces that, the degasifying thing. And one of the, Dave Owsley from up at, um, at uh, the facility up at Orofino was one who was responsible for kind of coming up with that procedure over the years. So in all of the 4,000s and all the 8,000s have these kind of tubes in them. The 2,000 doesn't have that. It just has a pipe with a bunch of holes in it and it's a spray bar system, and that becomes the life support system. Uh, drain pipes are involved in all of these areas. You'll see those in a minute. Um, so the water is constantly pumped from the sea chest by the pumps over these towers into the, into the holds, and then out a drain at the bottom, it's screened off so the fish don't get in there. So they're, um, they're in this optimum situation all the way down. They're acclimated where they come out of the ground or out of the hatchery but they're also getting good water all the way down. And it has these optimum saturation levels reducing TDG issues. Besides uh, the aeration system on the four and 8,000 systems, there's a sophisticated alarm system. Uh, it's called a P4. And in that thing, there's some sensors that you would actually drop into areas along, along here that you drop one in each hold and it tells you what the temperature and the oxygen levels are at all times. And if something goes haywire, there's an alarm goes off. That's where the sleep deprivation thing comes in. Because if you're in the, in the tugboat on your, on your bed and that thing goes off, then you've got to wake up everybody and get out there and fix it. So you spend a lot of time in this bar shack making sure that that doesn't happen on the way down, getting that stuff done. So um, anyway, uh, that's another upgrade that has been taken care of, better than the old handheld one, which we still have to do on the 2,000 barges. So it detects any failure in the operation below the accepted parameters in temperature and oxygen. And adult return data show that barging fish is one of the better tools in the arsenal of the, of the of documented smoke returns. I'll get to that in just a second, but that's finally right there. All right, the tugboat companies bid on the contract each year. Tidewater, Shaver, SDNS, and originally Bernard were people who handled this stuff. And uh, they're under contract uh, to USAC, and the fish facility uh, runs the guidelines. And, and then these barges and, and the tugs have priority over the lock system. 
more than once when we were in the low water, low water or hot water areas coming into the John Day, uh, we'd see a barge coming out of the lock and then we'd see a barge up there waiting and he's three or four miles back and I'm talking to the captain and I said, when that guy comes out of the lock, how come he's not ready to go in? And he said, well, he just messed around out there. And I said, tell him we're going around him. We got fish and the water's getting hot and we got to move. And so we did that several times. And uh, grain barges didn't matter. It didn't take us very long to go through a lock and out the other side. So we had those opportunities. And of course, when it did get warm, we had an option of always putting on another engine, another pump. We could pump more water and more oxygen over across them. And, and that helped cool things off as well. So we never really had an issue with a lost thing. One time after leaving Granite, we just left Granite and started it on the corner by Almoda Granary. And the engine caught fire. Engine room caught fire on the barge, on the tug. And so they had to pull over there. Well, fortunately, we were in a good part of the stream. We had the pumps and the motors going and everything stayed the same. And five hours later, they brought up another tug, hooked on to us, and we picked up the time on going down. All right, now I'll talk about turbines briefly. They're not a meat grinder, as some misinformed people think they are. Um, they got large screens. This is the new style that John was showing you, and this all's been changed a little bit. Whoops, I keep doing that. I'll go ahead and change it. I'm not having a good thing. Okay, so here is, here is the, the screen that's been put in there. If you put them straight down, the fish will get up against them and they can't get away from them. This way it diverts them and bounces them up here, and then they go up into this channel and into that cutout inside the dam, and then they go on over to the fish facility. But if they do go through this now, and I understand it's about 3%, get under this thing and they go in the turbines. Well, the new turbine design now has reduced that uh, destruction to the fish and descaling and so forth by the way they're designed. And a big bonus on this thing is now the, the turbines are actually getting about 4% more energy developed in their turntable now than they were before. So another, another thing is happening to make sure that things are better for everything we're concerned. Okay, next one. Here's another picture of it. Fish come up to the dam here, and if they go down to where that screen is, they go automatically up to this, and they go through this bypass, or I mean through the deal. This is kind of backwards from the way uh, granite is, is uh, built, but uh, they can either be diverted out into the channel, or you can come over this RSW, which is the one that comes off the top, instead of 50 or 60 feet down below, which was causing some problems. And so this all gets diverted, away from, from the uh, turbines. And there are a few that will go through, but the chances of them having any damage is kind of slim and none. Okay. And then they go to the separator, and I'll show you how they get there. And it selects by according to size and juvenile fish and debris that comes through. You've got to clean those all the time. There's also a pit tag. We talked about that earlier. A detection system after the separator that's sourced by code capabilities. And then they're, they're either direct loaded into the, a barge if you have a lot of numbers, and or they're put into uh, the holding raceways um, within 48 hours and then they're direct loaded or whatever. Okay, next. This is, this is a real improvement since I was there. They used to come down through a pipe from the, you can see up in the back up there, there's the, there's the spillway up there and in the powerhouse is in behind this. This thing just used to be a pipe that came down and you had to dewater and stuff coming down because it was a lot of water. So now this comes down and this thing is ideal designed to slow the water down and keep these fish into an environment where they're not getting descaled and beat up and stuff all the way down. And so they're coming, coming all the way down and then they, okay, next one. And there's a dewatering agent up above here before it ever gets to the circular system comes across here and then the dewaters out of here, it slows down the amount of water going into the separator. And then this is a bypass thing, goes out into the, uh, into the water. Okay, next. And the water comes into these raceways and you, there's a crowder back here. And so the guy can ride this and he can crowd the fish up. And then they go into this facility right here, which NOAA uh, operates. And this is where they do their tagging. And I'll show you that in a second. But anyway, they're in this uh, six and seven, and, and so this is how they get in here. Okay, next. And this is the lab area where the, uh, no, and I couldn't get a picture when they were working, but the fish are anesthetized and they're in here and they, they collect them and they identify them and then they tag them and then they stick them in here, next. 
And these are the tags. They have, depending on how many they need for the day, they'll, they'll use these. And I uh, used to have a gun that they were doing it and it was kind of cross-examining some disease with each one. So now they got a clean, clean gun and clean needles and so everyone gets a, gets a tag. And uh, about half of these fish that go into this NOAA trailer are put back to the ocean, or to, you know, to the ocean, to the water through the release pipe, and then the other part are put on the barge. Next. And here's the outfall pipe, and you can see the spray out here at the end. That's so that uh, avian predation doesn't take place. Down at McNary, even though they have the water going like that, you see the pelicans sitting right at the bottom of the outfall pipe just eating this or coming off. It's pretty, pretty devastating. This pipe used to go back out in toward the spillway. And you can see over here on the back side over here is the wall that goes into the lock. And uh, it was dropping smolts into that. And sometimes the eddy, based on the spill pattern, would catch those fish and they wouldn't get out as readily. So this puts them out a little further into the current. OK, next. <clears throat> this is an internal raceway where the sample is taken from. And uh, all these are connected. So if you get a lot of fish coming, you can put them in here and work them up. Next. This water goes down. So inside here, you have a group of folks. They're all the way from uh, Pacific States, fisheries, uh, EAS Environmental, USGS, I mentioned, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, PNNLL, Idaho Fish and Game, university personnel. And those are all selected uh, ahead of time. And then um, the juvenile fish facility uh, does quality control and all that. Next. And here's some Idaho fish and game folks when some fish come through that they want to deal with, then they record that. Next. Here's what happens when you anesthetize a nice fish that sits in there and it's very calm. And uh, he's a product called MS222 and then it just puts them to sleep for a little while. You can see this is a, an intact fish getting ready to go out and next, next slide, it'll, whoops, you went too far. Back up one. They go into this thing and these, these, these anesthetized fish come by, people identify them and they put them in whatever track they're going to and then they go into a, a different tank and that tank is going in into a different hold. So you don't have a whole bunch of steelhead in with a whole bunch of young juvenile fish that are gonna get eaten by them. All right, now we're gonna be talking about loading. Go ahead. Well, this is the separator office. This is where our separator tech, there's two a day, you'll spend 12 hours in here and recording everything. And I'll show you some of the stuff that, that happens that you're recording. But uh, this is this has worked out pretty well. You get in there and I've got it cleaned up a little bit now and got air conditioning and a furnace and stuff and so forth. But next, this is the separator. The water comes from that channel coming across, across this screen down this slideway and you see this fish, he wants to go back up, that's what they do. They're always going backwards. And they hit this screen and they fall through these barges, these bars. And sometimes you'll get a, a fallback. You'll get a salmon or a steelhead or maybe a spawned out steelhead called a kelt. Next. And as those fall through the bars and these air gates over here are constantly opening and closing and putting them into a raceway so you know where you're gonna put your fish on the barge. Next. And this is the office, and these, these are the, what the air gates are telling you. They're clicking and telling you what animals or which fish are going into what hold, and so you keep a record of that, and then the technician works all this up, and that goes on around the clock. Okay, next. This one I mentioned, kelp tanks. We get a kelp that comes back. We actually net it and put it into a tank, and it comes over here and it's stored in this tank. And then the tribal folks come down the next day. They come down every day, and and they take these colts and they, these kelts, put them in their little truck and they take them back up to the facility and they re refurbish them and then if they're healthy enough, they turn them loose because they don't all die like salmon do. Then they go back on out the ocean and do it all over again. I've heard stories about some in the Kenai up there that have been out eight or nine times. And so, anyway, next. All right, this is a good, good shot of what's all going on. Water's coming down here, there's the first, um, dewaterer and it hits this series here and then another dewaterer and there's a trailer where the tagging's going on and then this is all of the facility up in here where the raceways are and these capabilities of loading. These things right here if you've got a lot of fish coming you don't have raceways available for them you can load directly and the 
the yellow apron on there is to keep the sun from burning up the hose. And these are those aerators. And uh, you keep them clean and, and you keep them open so that uh, that water continues to go down through there. There have been some issues in the past with, if you know about Jim, Jim Hill mustard, it blows into the river from all over the country. When it gets wet, you can't do anything with it. It'll plug up these aerators quicker than anything. And so it's a real, one of those things you keep going. Next. And here's a picture of a shaver tug lined up with a, with a barge here. You see the barge is already running and the water's coming out of the spill. I'll show you that in a minute. Next. And these guys have just finished working up the fish in, this, in the uh, sample area. And they're going to put that right here in this tank because that's where they wanted them to go. Next. And there's a pipe coming out from gravity coming out of the, out of the facility. JFF stands for a juvenile fish facility. Next. And here's the fish coming out of that pipe. And this, this way we load them at every one of our facilities, whether it be down at Goose or, or down at uh, Lower Monumental. And these fish are a little bit of different everything coming in there. And that's what they do. They go in the water. Go ahead. And here's the facility down at, at Little Goose. And they're making, making place here. You got a 8,000 barge here pushing a 2,000. And this one, I guess, is going to go on down and get hooked up somewhere else. So those kind of things are, this is where we end up loading down there. Next one. And this is the one down at uh, Lower Monumental. And this is the same situation here. You got to cross over in front of the spillway. And so they usually shut that down for a minute or two so we can get the barge over there and get it up to the lock. And, and then all these fish come down. And there's that pipe. And we put it into one of these holes. And that, of course, has all been identified from up, upstream, OK? Now, here's a picture of a loaded 8,000 barge uh, on the way. That looks like a tidewater boat there pushing. And uh, you see the water coming out? That's where the water is going through that screen and coming out. And that runs the entire time. And like I tell you, we had the fire that was able to keep that running and keep the fish alive. It's been a pretty remarkable program. Next. Here's a picture of a, from the wheelhouse where the captain is, an 8,000 barge in front of us here, and a 2,000 barge in front. Well, this kind of a combination here, you know, you can easily have a million fish on, which has happened more than once. It's for you, whoever you are. <laughs> Somebody's got to go. Anyway, you can see Hood, Hood River Bridge in the background. This also is the wind surfer capital of the world. And uh, interesting, the closer you get to the to the bridge down here, those clowns will come from over here and they'll start, they won't jump over this part, but they jump over the stern of the, of the tugboat many times, come right up to you and make, make it interesting. One time I saw a barge going back up and there was a wind deal stuck on the, underneath the bow. I don't nobody, <laughs> nobody heard anything about it. I don't know what happened there, but okay, next. Now, this is what it looks like in the hold. These fish are real happy. They're swimming the whole time because the water's moving. Next one. And here they are again. And you can see the top of that screen where the water goes out. But this is what it looks like when you have a whole bunch of fish in there. And how we get them out of the barge? Next. This plunger comes up. <clears throat> There's an air plunger system. And that's why you have air things on the air, air uh, devices on the, on the boat or on the, on the, on the barge. We used to get our air, in some cases, we get our air from the tug. And sometimes that wasn't adequate enough. So this was an original one. And these rubber things came apart after four or five years. And they started plugging up systems. And they were horrendously expensive from whatever company had them. So next slide. So then we had all the great steel smiths down at Granite make, make ours after that. So they, they made these. And they put a rubber seal around the bottom of them. So they can change the rubber seals at, at will now. And that the design works really well. Next. Here's a picture of two barges returning. They're both 8,000 barges, probably coming back toward the end of the season. And I don't know what dam they're coming out of from over here. But anyway, they're on their way back. And that's a shaver boat there doing the pushing. Next. Uh, there's a 2,000 barge in front and an 8,000 barge here. And that's a Bernard boat. That had to be a long time ago. And the reason Bernard didn't get involved anymore is because their boats were limited with horsepower. And when the push coming out of Bonneville is really great in the spring, it can be five or 600,000 KCFS. It's just horrendous. And I remember one night we released, and we turned around. And so immediately after we got the fish out and turned around, 
I kind of looked at the shoreline to see where we were. By the way, we release always after dark and always in a different place. So we don't have predation by somebody getting used to what we were doing. But anyway, I went and I started cleaning up the hole and I came out and it had been two hours later, we hadn't gone 150 yards. The boat didn't have, the tug didn't have enough power to push up against that. They actually brought another tug up from Portland, hooked onto him, and we had to go all the way to the Dalles before we could release that other tug. So Bernard didn't get involved anymore. He didn't have the horsepower. And these others have a requirement of like uh, 1,500 horse to, per engine. Okay, next. This is a little indication of what was done and what wasn't done and what can be done. The black line is the amount of material that is collected and the, black, and the red line is the total transported. Keep in mind now, these, these are numbers that came from Lower Granite, Little Goose, Lower Monumental, and McNary. There's no hauling out of uh, Ice Harbor. But you see the trend here? We were doing a lot of things, and I asked the supervisor down there, I said, how come there was so much here? She said, well, we have to, trans we have to uh, bypass a lot of fish for lots of reasons. Sometimes a tug is coming back and a barge is damaged, needs repair, we don't have any place to put them, so we, we do that. So there's a lot of intricacies that go on, but you see what happens here? We weren't even collecting, we weren't even barging, and then, as Rusty was saying, you saw the results in 23. Okay, next. Continuing progress and positive upgrades at all dams for the safety and well-being of the fish. It's a big deal with the RF Corps engineers and the biologists that I talk to down there. It's not necessarily the silver bullet or the panacea uh, for survival issues, <clears throat> but it works when we work it. It's one of the opportunities in a time-proven way to get smolts past seven dams. Limit predation, limit time delays, reduce TDG levels and spill is increased and inference by turbines. It also addresses this issue that's been coming up here about delayed mortality. If the fish are having a little rough time getting down there, we can put them on a barge. And if we're getting them too fast, <coughs> we can slow down, make it happen. All right, next part. <coughs> All right, during the 10 year period from 2010 to 2021, there were more than 40 million Chinook, more than 22 million steelhead, more than 90,000 sockeye and kokanee, totaling more than 64 million healthy fish transported by barge to the estuary below Bonneville Dam. Let's give it a chance to work. The smallest act is certainly better than the greatest intention. Thank you for your time. Wow, that's a lot of great information. Um, I'm so glad that these are going to be uh, video recorded so that we can study them individually and when they get put online. Uh, that's some really good stuff. I mean, and he's not even a doctor, not got his doctorate degree, but I can tell you what, his life experience of doing this every day for you guys is phenomenal. Just to have the history of where they've improved this this system with barging and, the, and all, the, all that we've learned because they put forth the effort is truly a story that's not told, and we need to get this story told. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. If you come in and take your seats. We're glad you decided to come back. We've had some uh, really unique and interesting uh, lunchtime discussions. A lot of it is uh, the first experience I had when I ran into this group was, wow, I didn't know that. Or can you tell me a little bit more about what happens to fish? And that's, that's I think, some of what our conversations have been at lunchtime. So thank you, and we encourage you to continue to have those discussions. Um, we're going to maybe wrap up a little bit early. We have a couple things as a, uh, orders of business that we'll take care of uh, after our final presentation. And we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to ask questions to our presenters. And uh, they'll come up and we'll, we'll after our, our final presentation, we'll have an opportunity for that as well. So uh, now I'd like to start with our fourth presentation. And I'd like to introduce Jerry McGeehee. 
His education was he uh, received a BA of Biological Sciences at Northwest Nazarene College in Nampa, Idaho. He received training at Principles of Agri Aquaculture Production and Survey Methods at Kentucky State University. He was trained in cold water fish culture at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife National Conservation Training Center. He was also trained in fish health at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife National Conservation Training Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin. His experience includes work at the Clearwater Fish Hatchery Complex Supervisor, Superintendent, Manager, and Fish Culturist at various other fish hatcheries with the Idaho, Idaho Department of Fish and Game. His honors, he was the Station of the Year Award from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with the Lower Snake River Compensation Plan in Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. Also, he was Idaho Fish and Games Employee of the Year Award as a fish hatchery manager. Please help me welcome Jerry McGeehee. Well, first, before I get going, I put on a new slide last night, this first one, hoping that an old friend and my past supervisor when I was fish transport oversight team at Lower Granite, and probably the best steelhead fly fisherman on the Clearwater, and he's not even paying attention to me. But Steve, I'm glad to see you today. Stay strong, man. Anyway, thank you all for coming to our symposium today, and I hope you all had a good lunch. So before I get started, is there anyone here today other than myself that's actually raised salmon or steelhead or even transported salmon or steelhead? Cool. Usually when I ask that question, I'm the Lone Ranger. I'm the only one here. Good to see you guys. Marilyn? I'm pushing firmly, Marilyn. There we go. So aquaculture, I want to tell you guys, is the best career in the world. And I tried to choose one outstanding event from my adventure to share with you guys today. And I found it was impossible to separate two of them. One of them was I was a member of the design and construction team of the nearly $70 million project to build Clearwater Fish Hatchery and its four satellite facilities. And then spend 28 years there as the manager and finally the complex supervisor. Well, my 30 minute presentation might take longer. Go for it, Marilyn. <laughs> The second is the first aquaculture co-venture project with the Nez Perce Tribe, Idaho Fish and Game, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I know good and well there's some of you in the back row that think this is probably a brag picture, but it's actually a picture of a success story. Our part of this mission was to provide rearing space and Clearwater Hatchery staff to train the tribal fish culturists to art of fish hunts to the art of fish husbandry as the Nez Perce tribe worked to establish a coho run into the Clearwater drainage. I have great memories of working with Becky Johnson, Cy Whitman, Dave Johnson, and many, many other tribal members as they stepped into the world of aquaculture. During my 36 year career with Idaho Fish and Game, I was stationed at four different salmon and steelhead hatcheries, and I gained my knowledge of fish behavior while working at these hatcheries and being involved in the aquaculture duties to rear and release over 33 million steelhead smolts and 65 million Chinook smolts. Just for the fun of it, last night I put a pencil to that, converting it out with our average survival from green egg to smolt, that was 117 million green eggs using the fecundity, which is the average number of eggs per female, 
it came up to 24,300 females. So you got double that, 48,700 adults. Well, my job from 1980 until I retired on spawning crew was to either check the females for ripeness, like I am here, or to actually remove the eggs from the fish. So in that career, I handled at least 20,000 female Chinook. From my lifelong experience, I believe that the life cycle of salmon and steelhead and their tremendous increases of the 2000s and the problems that led to the recent declines is like a jigsaw puzzle with many, many pieces that are intricately interlinked together to form the current picture and story of their situation. The goal and mission of Citizens for Preservation of Fish and Dams is to provide an educational opportunity for the public to inform them of as many pieces of this puzzle as possible so that you may make an informed decision. So while I was getting ready, I had to decide was I gonna start with the fish or the egg, so I brought E.T. along with me today to help me get started. The most amazing piece that I'm looking forward to telling you all about is the tiny window of time in the life of a salmon and steelhead smolt when their bodies can change from living in fresh water to living in salt water. The word smolt might be new to some of you here today, and it is just the life stage of the juvenile salmon and steelhead when they're ready to leave fresh water, migrate to the ocean. After they have lived from 12 months to three years in the Idaho waters or in any one of the Idaho anadromous fish hatcheries operated by Idaho Fish and Game, Nez Perce Tribe, Fish and Wildlife Service, or Idaho Power Company, the smolts begin a physiological transition preparing them to migrate to the ocean. This transition and instinctive urge to migrate downstream is referred to as smoltification. These changes start during the late winter and early spring, and on some of the fish, even the previous fall. As the daylight hours increase in the spring, the physiological changes begin to take place both on the inside and the outside of the fish. On the outside, their camouflage coloring changes to bright silver and their scales loosen a little bit. Sometimes at the fish hatcheries, as smoltification and migration to the ocean became imminent, at the hatcheries we could see the silvery scales in the water like glitter. On the inside, the swim bladder is slightly increasing in size, causing them to ride higher in the water column as they travel downstream, kind of like you and I if we put a life jacket on. Another change will occur inside the smolts as their gills and kidneys reverse osmotic functions to accommodate the transition from fresh water to the brackish water of the estuary where the rivers meet the ocean and mix. This is preparing the smolts to eventually live in salt water of the Pacific. The increasing daylight hours of the spring triggers the start of these physiological changes in the salmon and steelhead smolts. At the same time, their freshwater environment is also changing. The snowpack in the mountains is melting and the spring runoff is beginning in the Idaho rivers. The rising water flow of spring runoff, combined with the increased buoyancy of the smolts, is the perfect balance to speed them on their way to the ocean. This increased buoyancy enables the smolts to easily take advantage of the faster flowing water in the top three feet of the river during the spring runoff. The increased daily photo period of springtime, the physiological changes of the smolts, and the rising water flow of the spring runoff in the rivers are perfectly choreographed with one purpose in mind and that's to get the smolts to the ocean 
in 14 to 21 days so they have their best chance to adapt to salt water. During this tiny window of time, the organs and the systems of the smolts have their best chance to change from living in fresh water to living in salt water. This adjustment enables them to live one to three years in the ocean environment to grow and mature to adults. If the smolts arrive late to the estuary and miss this tiny window of time, and their systems do not change to adapt to salt water, they will not be able to survive in the salty ocean environment. Travel time in of smolts to the ocean is only one of the many pieces of the puzzle of a successful anadromous fish life cycle. An important aspect of their trip to the ocean is keying in on the changing water chemistry or scent of the river. The smolts can detect changes to one part per billion. Now I know a lot of us hear one part per million and you can kind of relate to that. So I thought it would put that in perspective to time. One second in just under two weeks is one part per million. One second in 32 years is one part per billion. The fish can detect that much, that little of change in the river. The next puzzle piece is the adverse effect of increased total dissolved gas concentration and nitrogen saturation in the rivers of the migration corridor to the ocean. In the 1970s, state environmental agencies and the EPA established the total dissolved gas standards for the Lower Snake and Columbia Rivers. As John told us earlier, at first the agencies wanted to limit it to 105% of the rivers below the dams. And the reason was that years of experience at fish hatcheries, they had learned that 105% could be a lethal level to juveniles exposed to this concentration for very long. Well, however, the water coming into Lower Snake Reservoir from the Hell's Canyon complex was already at 108%. So therefore, the state and federal standards was set at 110%. Recent efforts to decrease the migration time to the ocean by increasing river flow is also accompanied by a court ordered allowing the percentage to go as high as 125%. This combination has created a very unhealthy environment for the smolts. A healthy total, total dissolved gas level for smolts is 102% and less. Gas levels will cause a condition called gas bubble disease and can be a deadly situation for a high percentage of the smolts. This disease is not caused by infection or infestation of disease causing agents, but from living in gas supersaturated water. When fish are living in water with a gas saturation that is, exceeds 102%, gas bubble disease can occur. Hatchery management textbooks and water quality manuals for recirculation says that theoretically, gas bubble disease can be caused by any supersaturated gas in the water. But in practice, the problem is almost always due to excess nitrogen. When water surrounding the fish is supersaturated with atmospheric gases, the fish's blood tends to become so as well. Because oxygen is used for respiration and carbon dioxide enters into the physiology of the blood and the cells, excess amounts of these two gases in the water is naturally taken out of solution by the fish's body. However, nitrogen being inert stays supersaturated in their blood. Any reduction in the water pressure on the body of the fish can bring such nitrogen out of solution in the blood to form bubbles 
And these bubbles are kind of like the bins in a diver if they come up too quick. These bubbles can lodge in the blood vessels and restrict respiratory circulation in the gills, leading to death by asphyxiation. In some cases, fish may develop very obvious bubbles in the gills, between the fin rays, under the skin, and the pressure of the nitrogen bubbles behind the eyes, like you can see in this fish, can sometimes even cause their eyes to pop out. Gas saturation can, be, can occur when air is introduced into the water under high pressure. For example, water that has plunged over waterfalls, over spillways, or water that has been drawn from deep dams. All fish, cold water, warm water, fresh water, or marine species are all susceptible to gas bubble disease. The threshold tolerance to the nitrogen saturation will vary among the different species, but any saturation over 100% possesses, poses a threat to the fish, and any level over 110% would call for remedial action at a fish hatchery. <clears throat> Textbook references say that nitrogen gas concentration in excess of 105% cannot be tolerated by trout fingerlings for more than five days. We have several hatchery managers sitting in the back row there, and at lunch we were talking about. They've all experienced that. Some of them, as you can see, one of them is at a hatchery that had pumped water, 105 to 108% would actually end up resulting in the fish floating upside down and then dying. During a conversation with Dave Owsley, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service retired from Dorshack Hatchery and the inventor of the degassing towers, he told me that once a nitrogen bubble has formed in the tissue of a fish, following the exposure to supersaturation, the bubble will not easily reabsorb into the bloodstream. This condition causes a blockage in the capillaries and can result in dead tissue in the affected parts of the fish. I recently read an article by a research team, the head guy was Rucker, and they found that the gas bubble diseases may cause floating problems due to the excessive amount of gas in the fish's bodies from an exposure to high gas levels, ultimately leading to upside down swimming and death. While working at my first station, Rapid River Fish Hatchery in Riggins, between the years 1980 and 1983, I also performed duties at the Lower Granite Dam with the Idaho Fish Transport Oversight Team during spring smolt out migration. <clears throat> A part of my daily duty was to examine fish collected for barge transportation. I examine them for percentage of descaling, hatchery fin marking, and signs of gas bubble disease. One of the worst days for signs of gas bubble disease occurred when the level below the tail race of the dam, that's immediately downstream, this was at Lower Granite, was 118%. We could see bubbles in the eyes between the fin rays and in the gills of the salmon and steelhead smolts. As I was operating the monitoring equipment for the gas saturation in the river hanging over the back of a jet boat, you could easily see the effervescence on the surface of the water, and it resembled much like um, pouring a glass of ginger ale. The live steelhead and salmon with the visual signs of the gas bubble disease were collected and a NOAA research team subjected them to a 30-day saltwater challenge. There were no survivors from the test. The newly court-ordered and approved gas saturation level concentration that may be created below the Lower Snake and Clubbery River dams is 125%. This is only 2% less than a lethal concentration, 127% reported in water quality manuals, and 9% higher than my observation in the early 80s. 
This new level is 15% above the historically targeted 110% gas saturation for operation of the dams by the Army Corps of Engineers. This is a table, whoops, got two for one there? To the table, yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. This is a table from a USGS study where this research team took salmon and steelhead smolts, exposed them to different levels of the gas saturation and exposure time, and the goal of the study was to find out how long it took to achieve 20% mortality. The first level they tested was 110%, and some of the exposure times were up to 22 days, and at that level, they did not ever achieve a 20% mortality. Next, they were exposed, new fish of course, to 120%. Some of their tests were up to 140 hours, and the Chinook had 20% mortality from 40 to 120 hours, and the steelhead 20 to 35. Now, when they increased the level to 130%, the fish were only exposed for 11 hours, and you can see that the, they achieved their 20% mortality pretty quickly at, those t at that higher level. <clears throat> when I spoke to the supporters of the court-ordered increase, allowing the gas to go to 125%, they claimed that the smolts would just dive deeper to protect them from the gas bubble disease. From my personal observations, the action of diving deeper as a smolt travels to the ocean would be against their natural instinct to ride higher in the water column, taking advantage of the faster water current near the surface. This is an instinct as strong as ducks and geese wanting to fly south for the winter. They would also be fighting the additional buoyancy they experience naturally during the smolting process and the 125% will add even more buoyancy to the smolt from the higher concentration of nitrogen in the bloodstream, as earlier stated in the research article by Rucker and his team. You would have to ignore the smolt's natural instincts and these increased buoyancy factors to believe that all the smolts will simply dive deeper to be protected from the gas bubble disease. Also, if a fish is suffering from the effects of the gas bubble disease or any illness, I'm going to tell you guys, they don't feel well. And they're not expending extra great amounts of energy to dive deep because they don't feel well. I've watched fish that are not well and they float near the surface, expending very little energy as they float along with the current. I believe it is unrealistic to expect fish that have been exposed to high gas levels or ill from gas bubble disease to expend extra energy to dive deep and maintain that depth for up to two weeks as they migrate to the ocean. Their instinct is to float with the current, conserving their energy for their conversion to salt water. The smolts either can't or won't maintain a significant depth as they drift backwards to the ocean. And this is evident by the quantity of bird depredation and their capturing and eating of the smolts as they float near the surface. When the total dissolved gas in the Snake River arriving at Lower Granite Dam is 108% and above, as John told us earlier, it will remain at that unhealthy level as they travel 300 miles downstream to the estuary. The time of the smoke migration to the ocean and exposure to gas supersaturation in the migration corridor of the Lower Snake and Columbia Rivers are two important pieces of the smoke grape migration puzzle. In an effort to assure the smolts move quickly through the slow moving water of the eight hydro projects and protect them from the gas saturation, the Army Corps of Engineers has designed 
and constructed super tanker barges, as Dan described earlier. The smokes safely are moved downstream of Bonneville, the last dam. These barges supply a constant flow of fresh water through the onboard degassing towers, and these degassing towers reduce the gas saturation in the river to 103% or less, a level safe for the juvenile salmon and steelhead. The smokes barge ride lasts about 40 hours. Focusing only on the parameter of total gas disease, excuse me, total gas concentration. As a career aquaculture person, my choice would be to place fish that we have raised for 12 to 18 months in an environment of 103% instead of 125%. I believe it is very risky gamble to intentionally expose smolts to a level above 110%. Third and not the final piece of the puzzle is the missing nutrients to the spawning grounds and early rearing areas of the Snake River drainage. This missing piece is a very significant element for a successful wild spawning population. And I found through 36 years, it's very seldom talked about. Okay, Marilyn, we need help. The scene of wild spawning salmon racing across the shallows of a pristine Idaho wilderness stream is a rare event in the 21st century. In the past, it may have appeared very much like this Alaska picture. My first opportunity to witness this primordial spawning ritual was in the late summer of 1984 as I was on staff at the McCall Summer Chinook Hatchery. We had opportunity to assist other biologists with spawning ground surveys. We first attended a training in Bear Valley on Marsh Creek, a tributary to the Middle Fork of the Salmon near Stanley, Idaho. Following the training, we would walk along and through several miles of remote mountain streams looking for active spawning pairs of salmon or completed reds. A red is the site where a salmon has spawned and is quite visible as a four to eight foot circular clean spot on the darker colored mossy stream bed. Right, you guys can all see that right there, lighter spot. <clears throat> the moss is cleaned from the river cobble as the female pounds her tail on the gravel to cover the eggs she has just deposited on the stream bed. Several years later, I had the opportunity to look over several miles of Alaskan spawning grounds. I was on a caribou hunt. The guide was driving the boat down the river coming out of Bashiroff Lake. And I said, can you slow the boat down so I can look at the river bottom? It looks weird. Ah, Jerry, it's dead fish. Slow the boat down. I want to see it. I'm telling you, it's dead fish. I finally convinced him to slow the boat down. I couldn't believe what I saw. The river bottom was so thickly covered with the spawned out carcasses of salmon that the river current had lined them up on the bottom from shore to shore. And this is a river as big as the Clearwater out here by Potlatch. They were lined up, laid on the bottom. It looked like shingles. It looked like shingles on a roof. This was a scene of an adequate annual replenishment of nourish, nutrients excuse me, to a healthy and nourishment-rich spawning ground and early rearing area. I returned home to my new duty station of Clearwater Fish Hatchery with an idea of how we might help the wild spawning salmon. We worked with our Idaho Fishing Game Pathology staff to develop a protocol to push the button and make the PowerPoint go. <laughs> it's a protocol to return the spawned out carcasses from our Powell and Red River salmon spawning facilities to the historic spawning grounds in those drainages. You didn't believe I handled 20,000 fish, did you? Idaho Fish and Game research biologists evaluated these efforts along with the release of live salmon adults 
from our hatchery trap to spawn naturally in these areas. The evaluation was titled Idaho Supplementation Study. After almost 20 years, the studies showed that our effects were inadequate to reestablish sufficient nutrients to support a self-sustaining natural origin salmon population in the Clearwater River study area. Saving Idaho anadromous fish runs is a puzzle that is a much, much more complex thing than any one single item. The highest number of salmon and steelhead ever counted over Bonneville and Lower Granite, like Dr. Bottinger's chart showed, occurred in 2001, and high numbers continued to 2015. And this is while eight dams were all in place. 2001 was an incredible year for all of us. At the fish hatcheries, I'll tell you, it was a bit of a headache. There were so many fish in the traps, we had to put them in trucks, transport them back downstream so that they could go through the sport fishery again. I can't wait to see that. I'm retired. I'm going to be fishing every day. Right, Charlie? Okay, help me out. <laughs> We do have hundreds of miles of pristine waters in Idaho for anadromous fish spawning, and they have been starved of nutrients for many decades. Healthy spawning grounds should look like this Alaska stream. Oregon Fish Commission reports show that as early as 1866, these spawning waters have been starved for nutrients that are carried back to Idaho from the ocean by the spawning adults. All salmon and the majority of steelhead die after spawning, leaving the nutrients they carried from the ocean in their bodies to decompose, adding essential nutrients to the ecosystem of the early rearing streams. This last ditch effort by the adults is completing their life cycle and supplying nutrients for their progeny. This loss of nutrients began even prior to 1938 construction of Bonneville Dam. And that is the first dam that the salmon and steel had encountered on their way home to their spawning grounds. Idaho Fishing Games Clearwater Regional Manager, Joe DuPont. Back one, please. explained during an eye-opening, and I mean eye-opening presentation on the salmon history, that prior to 1938, the processing at Lower Columbia River salmon canneries peaked in 1883 when they removed over 42,800,000 pounds of Chinook from the river. Joe's presentation also showed us that as much as 60% of the Columbia River salmon run were bound for the Idaho spawning grounds. This converts to Idaho spawning grounds being deprived of perhaps 25 million pounds of nutrients in that one year. Using this 60% and the Oregon Fish Commission reports beginning in 1866, Prior to the 1938 completion of Bonneville Dam, over 1.6 billion pounds of salmon destined to pristine spawning grounds of Idaho were removed from the Columbia River and processed for food. This Chinook harvesting peaked, as I said, 42.7 million in 1883, and the next year, 42.2 million pounds were harvested. Annual takes of Chinook salmon from the Columbia River finally fell below 20 million pounds around 1928, an entire decade prior to the construction of Bonneville. According to Anthony Netboy, the author of The Salmon, Their Fight for Survival, he has a note in there that in 1911, the catch peaked again at 42,630,000 pounds, 600,000, 30 pounds. 
with another salmon species making up a large portion of the catch because Chinook destined for the upper basin tributaries had been severely overfished. A steady decline in annual take of Chinook continued until it fell below 7 million pounds in 1970. According to these Oregon Fish Commission reports from 1866 to 1970, 1.73 billion pounds of Chinook salmon destined for Idaho waters were removed from the Columbia River, resulting in pretty sterile Idaho ecosystem to rear salmon and steelhead smolts. I tell you guys, to me it is absolutely staggering to try to comprehend this quantity of nutrients robbed from the spawning grounds, literally starving the ecosystem of the early rearing areas for the Idaho salmon and steelhead smolts, leaving them incapable of feeding a flourishing salmon and steelhead population. This 157 years of nutrient depletion from 1866 to now has absolutely nothing to do with dams. I'll tell you, it's the results of the lust for the taste of salmon and the greed for money. The next piece of the puzzle of Salmon and Steelhead's story is the Lower Snake River Compensation Plan, which funds the operation of 10 salmon and steelhead hatcheries and 16 satellite facilities in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. This compensation is to mitigate and restore lost adult salmon and steelhead as a result of construction and operation of the four dams on the Lower Snake River in Washington. These hatcheries provide spawning operations, incubating eggs, rearing the juvenile salmon and steelhead to the smolt stage, and then transporting those smolts to the pristine headwaters and historic spawning grounds. These hatcheries and the hard work of hundreds of dedicated staff are the stop gap measure to provide a missing piece of the puzzle from the life cycle of the salmon and steelhead. The substitute piece is the hatcheries. They are acting as the replacement of the missing essential nutrients that have been depleted in the early rearing areas. An example of their stopgap measure the five Idaho Lord Snake hatcheries fed 357,800 pounds of feed to brood year 2005 salmon and 896,900 pounds of feed to brood year 2006 steelhead. A total of 1,254,700 pounds of feed that was fed just to the out-migrating smolts of 2007. During a dam removal symposium held here in Clarkston a few years ago, an Army Corps of Engineers representative was asked if the funding of the Lower Snake hatcheries would continue if the dams were removed. The answer at the time was that the Corps would fund the rearing of the fish on hand in all the hatcheries and then no longer provide funding to the hatcheries. Since the funding was mitigation for operating the dams, and since the dams would no longer exist, the payment of the mitigation dollars would end. And I happened to be there that day and the fellow that asked the question is in the back row. The loss of funding and closing of the lower snake hatcheries would be catastrophic and lead to the demise of salmon and steelhead in this region. Without the full restoration of the missing nutrients to the pristine early rearing waters of Idaho prior to closing hatcheries, 
The recovery of historic numbers of natural spawning salmon and steelhead population in Idaho would be unlikely. Recently, I was asked, what do you attribute the tremendous increase in success of the 2001 return? Well, from 1980 to when I retired in 2016, at the hatcheries, we were always working on research. Every year, there was something we worked on. Increase the quality of smolts, perfecting transportation, trying to find the best timing of release, even if it was by moonlight. These are just to name a few. <clears throat> At the same time, the Corps of Engineers and their fish biologists and technicians were striving to perfect the survivability of the smolts to the estuary. From the smolt out migration of 1998, 99, and 2000, that's what brought back the 2001 run. I'm just going to tell you that everything must have been firing on all cylinders to produce that adult return of 2001. I believe it's the same old thing that I've been telling you about. It's the same old puzzle, many, many pieces. Some of them man can do something about, and some of them you can't. You need to focus on the ones that you can affect. The recovery of historic numbers of salmon and steelhead to Idaho will require a much more complex solution than any one single action. In closing, I'd like to repeat that the highest number of Chinook and Steelhead ever counted over Bonneville and Lower Granite occurred in 2001 and continued with high numbers to 2015 while all eight dams were in place. I'd also like to remind you of the Coho success story and the coal venture with the Nez Perce tribe and the state and federal agencies. From my observation, it's past time for people to take a deep breath and a step back and work together to determine all of the details that attribute to the historic number of salmon and steelhead in 2001 and continue to 2015. We should do all we can to duplicate these actions to save our fish. And I'd like to thank you all today for coming and listening to us. Okay, I guess we'll get uh, started if you'd like to come and take your seats. We're moving right along. I think they've done a good job in timing of our, of our symposium. Again, uh, our final presentation prior to our question and answers will be uh, Mr. John McKern, and he's gonna, his uh, presentation is predation and snake river salmon, and s the snake river salmon. Okay, you thank go. you. Um, is this too loud? Okay. When I went to work for the Corps of Engineers and they showed me my job description, it said that I had to collaborate. And I wasn't too sure what that meant. And they said, well, everything we do is coordinated with the Fish and Wildlife Agencies and it's your job to collaborate with them. Well, at that time we had what was called a Fisheries Engineering Research Technical Mid Committee or FERTEC and we met every month in Portland with the fishery agencies. Um, that has morphed over the years and the names changed. Right now it's the Fish Passage Evaluation Program. But during the Nixon administra administration, it was called the Fisheries Advisory Technical Committee. Well, that came out to an acronym of FARTCOM. <laughs> that wasn't why they gave it up. Uh, the, the Nixon com uh, presidency didn't want advisory committees. So um, I'm going to now talk about predation. I know there have been several people who have asked questions about that. I guess it's still... No? 
Okay, we've talked about the life cycle of the salmon from eggs on down to swim up, fry to fry to smolts to going out into the ocean, early ocean, returning as adults, and coming back to the spawning area. Still not working. Go ahead. Well, when the fish get up into the headwaters to spawn, which we have here at Pair of Chinook, they often have observers that are standing by to pick off eggs, and uh, not all of the eggs are fertile, or fertilized, I should say, but it, typically it's around 90% in the wild, which is pretty high. And then, of course, they develop and into fry, or into, uh, yeah, yolk, yolk sac fry, and uh, going from there. So go ahead. Yeah. These, whoops, I think we went one too many. Yeah. Okay, these are some of the predators that uh, might be run into as the adults are up there and as the eggs are laid that are eating the eggs or eating fish, like this guy here. River otters, of course, mink, and a raccoon. So next. Some of the things that also would be eating eggs, the sculpins are probably one of the big predators on fish eggs, crayfish, uh, perhaps dippers, and not so much on the eggs, but on the young fish as they come out, the cormorants. I read one paper by a Dr. Flats from the University of Idaho that said he was up doing some uh, snorkeling, getting a census of the juvenile fish that had been produced. He quit, went back the next day, and was swimming upstream further than he had been, and all of a sudden he wasn't seeing fish, but he was seeing sparkly things in the water. And he's got up further, he found out that it was the scales and what was left of the fins of fish that were being eaten by a family of cormorants. Okay, as the fish develop and are going uh, into the fry stage, of course, there are a lot of other fish that eat them. I believe that the bull trout that are found in the upper streams, the coldest water streams, uh, evolved with the salmon eating eggs and fry. Of course, we have the cutthroat trout. They love to eat eggs and fry. Rainbow trout's a little bit of a question mark because so many different kinds of rain rainbow have been stocked into so many different streams. But they are probably a predator. Once upon a time, I was at a meeting and an old fish biologist uh, from Idaho Fish and Game by the name of James Keating told me that he had been responsible for stocking brook trout into headwater streams in the clear water. Brook trout are probably also another predator. Here are some other predators. These are all introduced predators. We've heard quite a bit about smallmouth bass and as I've been working on this project and talking to people, I've learned that the smallmouth bass are eating a lot of smolts too. I know a study that was done by Idaho University back in the 1980s indicated the smallmouth bass's diet was about 85% crayfish. But apparently now they're eating a lot more uh, smolts and fry. One thing I'd like to point out is that the, the fall Chinook are different than the spring, summer Chinook and steelhead. The spring, summer Chinook and steelhead all rear in fresh water and migrate out of smolts. The fall Chinook, the eggs are laid in Hell's Canyon or the lower Clearwater or lower Salmon River, and the juveniles, after they swim up, start migrating downstream and slowly migrate and grow as they go. Another introduced predator of some fame is the walleye, and the walleye uh, is a prodigious fish eater and is now found at least from Hell's Canyon Dam down to, say, Vancouver, Washington, maybe even further down than that. Uh, crappies are another fish eater, and probably if they're affecting fish, it'd probably be more the, ju the small uh, fall Chinook than the spring summer Chinook and steelhead. Channel catfish, you might think, well, they're probably not a predator. When I went fishing, I went up into Hell's Canyon the first time in the 1970s. Uh, 
being a fish biologist, I had my fishing rod with me, right? You know, in the Corps of Engineers, if you're a geologist, you can take your rock hammer anywhere and it's part of your work. But as a fish biologist, it's got to be recreation if you're using it. Well, I was sampling, and I cast a MEP spinner out. It went by a rock out in the Snake River in Hell's Canyon, and I hooked a pretty good-sized fish. Not like that, channel catfish. So I cast out again. I hooked another pretty good-sized fish, channel catfish. What do you suppose they were eating? What was going by when my spinner wasn't there? Okay, next one. You've seen this picture already, and these are juvenile steelhead in the gut of a male walleye. You know it's a male because this is a testy and not a sack full of eggs. And so now they're in Hell's Canyon, clear down into the uh, mouth of the Snake River and on down the Columbia. The ones in the Columbia River had sent, originally came from Banks Lake from Lake Roosevelt up uh, on the Columbia. And in 1967, a strange fish came into the collection at Oregon State. So I put it in a five gallon jug full of formaldehyde. It was a six pound female walleye that was caught at Corbett, Oregon in a gill net. Next one. Another predator you may have heard of the northern pike minnow, and this is from a web page on the internet, and you can go into any year you want to and find out how many pike minnow bounties were paid and who was the highest paid. The biggest, biggest winner in uh, 2023 so far is $69,000 that this person has, has realized from catching pike minnows. Next. We also have heard a little bit about predators, flying predators. Uh, seagulls have been around all along, and there are wires stretched across the base of the dams from the powerhouse, usually to the navigation lock, to prevent seagulls from coming up and preying on fish coming out of turbines or spillways. Turns, numbers have increased remarkably, but uh, being somewhat more skillful flyers, they'll actually fly under those wires. In 1970, 1970s, I was the administrator on a contract for uh, the inventory of wildlife and associated habitats on the Columbian Snake Rivers that spanned the area from the mouth of the Columbia to the Canadian border and from the mouth of the Snake River to Weezer, Idaho. And at that time, the University of Idaho report indicated there were maybe a half a dozen double-crested cormorants below Ice Harbor Dam. Now, they're all through the system in large numbers and take millions of juvenile fish. We've heard of white pelicans in that study, and, and from my own personal observations, we never saw white pelicans when I went to work for the course 50-some years ago. They weren't there. Uh, but now they are. You'll see hundreds of them on McNary Reservoir. You'll see them on the other reservoirs. Um, where was I? I saw, oh, I know, I was taking a picture at McNary, and there was one in the tail race of the powerhouse. Then there's another reservoir predator. I was somewhat younger then. But I, my wife and I were out fishing at Lions Ferry. This is Joso Dam. And I had recently had a school on how to catch walleye that was put on by a fisherman guide from down below McNary Dam, down in the, uh, or below John Day Dam. And I went out with my wife and we tried his method. These are two females that we caught. We also caught a, a male that was about six pounds, but this one weighed 16 pounds and this one weighed 10 pounds. So I went home, I noticed when I dressed them, they had these large globs of eggs in them. I went home and checked the fecundity on the internet and probably this one had 500,000 eggs in her and this one at least 250,000. 
That's 750,000 little salmon eaters that won't be born that year. Okay? So, some of the others, the bald eagle. Bald eagles are really scarce. And we're on the endangered species list for quite a time. Ospreys were really scarce. The first time I saw an osprey, I saw one on the Kalapuya River, which is a tributary of the Willamette when I was a boy. The next time I saw them was up on Dwarshack Reservoir where they were nesting. Bald eagles we hardly ever saw. Well, I, in my earlier talk, I talked about DDT. DDT was the causative agent, in my mind, of the decline of a lot of fish-eating birds. They would eat fish that had concentrated. I showed how it's concentrated up the, the food chain. They would eat fish that had concentrated DDT in their uh, bodies, and it would affect the eggshells of the bald eagles, the ospreys, the brown pelicans, the white pelicans, all of the fish-eating birds. And what was found in the research was that the eggshells were getting thinner and they were liter literally crushing their own eggs when they attempted to brood them. Well, the use of DDT has been greatly curtailed over the last, gee, I don't know, 20, almost 30 years. Uh, and so these fish-eating birds have bounced back and that's why we have so many cormorants, we have so many white pelicans, we have more bald eagles and more ospreys. It's hard to drive from Walla Walla to Yakima and not see dozens of, of nest structures that have been put up for uh, ospreys. Next one, please. Okay, so down in the estuary, we have concentrations of predators. White pelicans, this, these are the uh, terns that were on East Sand Island. They've since been moved by some innovative research methods, uh, and right now they're trying to move some of them down to Malheur Refuge in South Central Oregon. These are cormorants on East Sand Island, and of course they're trying to reduce their numbers. I was down at the mouth of the Columbia Fishing uh, quite a few years ago and ran into the Oregon State uh, research team that was studying bird life, and the brown pelicans were just thick on the estuary of the Columbia. And I asked the uh, Oregon State researchers if they had an estimate on how many brown pelicans were there, and they said at least 20,000. There weren't any there 50 years ago. So next slide, please. Oh, yes. This is the bridge at uh, Astoria. And there have been a lot of news in the paper about the cormorants being forced from East Sand Island up onto this bridge where they're nesting. Well, I can attest to the fact that they were there in 2008. I had a brand new research boat. We were putting uh, receivers on the bridge for tracking Chinook that were tagged in Idaho, and some of them swam downriver and some were barged. And as I drove my brand new boat through there, I honked the horn. That's a mistake. <laughs> so yeah, we had to wash the boat. <laughs> the first thing they do when they jump off of their nest or off of the rail there is crap. So uh, yeah, next slide please. Okay, some other ones. This one over here is the thresher shark or the salmon shark. Uh, fishing up in the Queen Charlotte Islands, I was fishing off of a, we, we were taking two people with a guide out in small boats from a ship, and we were trolling out there, and one of these boats trolled past, and all of a sudden here was something flying through the air behind it, and it looked just like that. And they, people came in and they said, what was that that came up behind us? And I said, well, I think it was a thresher shark. Yes. Okay, this is uh, the wahoo or the king mackerel, and they get to be five to six feet long. The reason that picture's in there is because I said earlier in my other talk, they caught one off the Skeena River up by Prince Rupert in the ocean. These are tuna that'll feed on juvenile fish or feed on, well, probably mostly on juvenile fish. And then we have the orca 
feeding on salmon. And we all know that the uh, southern resident orca population is in trouble. And some people blame that on the lower Snake River dams. Next slide, please. And then there's the thresher shark that showed up yesterday in the Salmon River at Riggins. Did you guys see that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought it must be a young one because its tail isn't fully developed. Okay, next slide, please. So they are now an in, no. Joe DuPont made it clear that thresher sharks are not found living in the Salmon River or in fresh water for that matter. Okay, this is going back to the killer whale and this guy up here is not shooting the killer whale. He's sticking a dart in it so he can get a sample of fat and that's how they get this breakdown of all of these different pesticides and so forth that are in the body of the fish. And it's probably one of the most contributing factors uh, to the, the lack of reproduction. This Labrador retriever doesn't retrieve uh, killer whales. He's what's called a trained whale poop, whale poop sniffer. So he rides on the bow of the boat and when he smells killer whale poop, he whines and points that direction. They go out and scoop it up. And that's how they do a DNA analysis to find out what killer whales have been eating. Now people claim that breaching the lower snake dams would be a real boon to the killer whales. But this, these studies have indicated that uh, Snake River salmon don't make up more than 2% of the uh, diet of the, lower, or the southern resident killer whale pods. Next slide. Okay, so, but they do eat salmon. This is another fishing trip, and we're up in the Queen Charlotte Islands, and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, here comes a pod of about 20 uh, killer whales toward where we were fishing. And we're fishing along, nothing's really biting, but just before this one got to us, my friend Mike here hooked, uh, not a big Chinook, maybe 20 pounds, maybe 15 pounds, and it was fighting, and it swam this way, and this cow killer whale swam this way, and it swam that way, and the cow killer whale swam that way, and then Mike's line went slack. He reeled it in, and what he had was the head and jaws, part of the head and the jaws of that salmon. Killer whale's echolocation system is so highly developed that they could tell where the hook was. I asked a friend of mine who had worked in the sable fish or Alaskan cod fishery, and the longliners oftentimes pull up cod that are bit off behind the head. And they have, because they had the, the hook in their mouth, the killer whales took what was behind the hook. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's the biggest predator. Yeah, in the ocean, like I said earlier, uh, on the fall Chinook from Lions Her Fat Lions Ferry Fish Hatchery, a study showed that uh, wire-coated tagged fish made up from Lions Ferry, made up, uh, 75 percent of the Lions Ferry fish were in the uh, ocean fisheries. The one thing about trollers, if they hook fish that are smaller than they want or fish they don't want, they shake them off. They're called shakers, and if you damage them enough, they're not going to live to spawn. Saners surround schools of fish, pull them up, and they have fish in there that they don't want. They're called uh, bycatch, and they're thrown back. Now, the gill netters have stretched mesh that's designed to catch certain fish, and sometimes fish will get injured and fall out. So they're wasted and won't come back to spawn or won't be eaten by someone. The trawlers, I put that in because right now, up in the uh, Keener River in Alaska, the Chinook fishery is closed. It's been closed for a couple of years. And they are blaming it on trawlers that are working offshore. The trawlers are trawling on the bottom and Chinook often go down deep and are caught in those and they wind up as bycatch. So they're blaming it on the bycatch as the reason why the Keener River 
uh, Chinook run is not high enough to support a sport fishery. The word Chinese is mentioned in their uh, report. Okay, and here we have some others that are found the coast uh, up in uh, Alaska and British Columbia and along the coast. You have sea lions along the coast of Oregon, seals. One of the biggest Chinook I ever hooked was up in the Queen Charlotte Islands. And boy, I was having a wonderful fight when it suddenly took off and went over into the kelp bed. And one of these sea lions came up picking his teeth with a fish bone. Next slide. Okay, here's another area where the predation is pretty heavy at times. This is the Boy 10 fishery. This is the line here. And fish are coming in to the Columbia. And the, when the season is open, the Boy 10 fishery uh, can be very heavy, as you can see here. Yeah. This is the Young's Bay control zone where they release juvenile salmon for a selective fishery by commercial fishermen. Okay, next slide please. Well, here's another predator that uh, is pretty well known on the lower Columbia. Again, uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 has been protecting seals, sea lions, and other marine mammals now for uh, over 50 years. And this has been the result. When I was a boy growing up and we were fishing on, say, the Al Sea Bay or the Newport Bay down in Oregon, you never saw a seal or a sea lion. Well, one time I saw a sea lion. But now you go down there and boats are uh, covered with them, docks are covered with them. This is the East Boat Basin at uh, Astoria. And those are the sea lions. Uh, a lot of them, the biggest are stellars, and the smaller ones are California sea lions. Uh, hundreds of sea lions are scheduled to be killed in an effort to uh, save endangered salmon and steelhead, and this is in the Endangered Salmon Prevention Act of 2018. Next slide, please. That's not a new issue. Here's a picture that comes from West Shore Magazine, June 1886, when they were out shooting seals and sea lions that were taking part of their part of the salmon run. You can't let them take it because it's your, they're your fish. So here we got a gill net. These guys are out shooting the sea lions and seals. Next slide, please. So we get up we're going to have a good Chinook run, and they open up the season, and here we had, from 2023, Rapid River Run, uh, Hell's Canyon, Clearwater River Fisheries, spring Chinook fishing was opened up. Okay, next slide, please. And finally, they get back up to the spawning grounds, and there are certain critters there that take fish before they get to spawn, or like I said, or before eat on them after, after they're wild or spawning. I put this in to remind me that if you've read uh, the Locksaw story, you know that uh, grizzly bears at one time were a, a I don't want to say significant, but a, another predator on the salmon that made their way up there. And of course they and the co uh, coyote or the black bear are delivering some of that nutrient that Jerry talked about uphill. So that can be an important factor. And maybe now you've got uh, grizzly bears again in the lock saw, I don't know. This is a picture from the Clearwater River uh, from when I was once up hunting uh, along the Clearwater. So next slide, please. So we've made it our way all the way around. And we're back at the beginning. Next slide. I've already, yeah, I've already showed you these in my previous talk and show you what happens with 5,000 eggs and a pair of spring Chinook. Next slide. And so here we have it with 90% uh, fertilization. You got 450 or 4,500 eyed eggs. All of this all the way down, you've already seen. And if you get down here, if you had two 
that got back, you had a, a SAR of 1.6%. Of if you had four that got back from the two that spawned, it was 1.8%. So uh, I looked at, looked at this and I said, hmm, 5,000 eggs, two adults, they withstand 99.96% mortality in a stable population. Two salmon to two salmon. Okay, and I think that's the end of it. Oh, I wanted to hit the smolt to adult return rates again. And I still think they're a polar measure of measuring salmon survival because the smolt numbers are estimated, not counted. There are pit tag detectors on the collection systems at the dams, and now we have a pit tag detector on at least one spillway at Lower Granite. But when you're operating eight spillway bays and you only have a detector on one, you don't really know how many juvenile fish went through there. There are results, like I showed before, uh, of percentages of fish going by each way. <clears throat> Adult salmon are harvested. I, you know, I leaned on that really heavily because in the ocean, ocean survival is the biggest uh, impact on the salmon survival. And the fishery agencies estimate the Columbia River returns and then control harvest to remove adults above what they consider a, an escapement goal. If you follow the fisheries regulations very much, you know that along the coast of Washington, uh, the season will be open, the season will be closed. The season will be open, the season will be closed. That's based on these estimates and they're trying to provi or provide that escapement. When there are high estimates, harvest is increased, artificially lowering the SARs. In other words, if they didn't increase survival, a lot more of those fish would get back to Lower Granite Dam and the SR SARs would be a lot higher. When the returns are higher, they allow fishing on adults above Lower Granite Dam, which I showed a picture of, and that reduces the number of adults that spawn. Do I have one more? Is that it? Nope. That concludes my talk, and I thank you all for being here to listen. Thank you. Well, thank you. This concludes our, our first symposium. We hope it was meaningful and insightful to you. We hope that you can share the information. We'll have this, the proceedings of this symposium on the World Wide Web so that you can access the information. Please share it with those who may be interested in the information that was presented. Thank you and Godspeed in your travels. Have a wonderful evening.